Jedan. Dobre, u, prejako. Jedan. Jedan. Još sam danas tako jako. Jedan, dva, jedan, dva, jedan, dva. U, u, jedan. Ide u limit. Ali nema veze, oni su tu. Jedan. Jedan.
Good morning, everybody. Um, this is our second day of the conference. I hope you are all fresh and, and uh, have enough energy to follow this second day, which I believe would be as good and exciting as yesterday. And I'm almost sure because the, our first presenter today is Sara Salem assistant professor in sociology at the London School of Economics. Uh, Sarah's research uh, interests include political sociology, post-colonial studies, Marxist theory, feminist theory, and global histories of empire and imperialism. Uh, she's particularly interested in questions of traveling theory, post-colonial anti-colonial nationalism, and feminist theory. She has published articles on intersectionality, Intersectionality as Traveling Theory in 2016 on Postcolonial History of Egyptian Women's Movement for Women of Egypt, Memory, Geopolitics and Egyptian Women's Movement during the Nasser and Sadat eras in 2017 on Egyptian Women's Movement Transnational Entanglements on Transnational Feminist Solidarity, the case of Angela Davis in Egypt in 2018 an article on Franz Fanon and Egypt's postcolonial state, uh, reading Egypt's postcolonial state through Fanon, hegemony, dependency, and development in 2017, and uh, haunted histories, Nasserism, and the promises of the past in 2019, on Nasserism and anti-colonial, anti-imperialist hegemonic political project, project and its afterlife, up to the revolution of 2011. Sada published last year a wonderful, methodologically very important book, Anti-Colonial Afterlives in Egypt, The Politics of Hegemony. And uh, uh, judging on the, on the description of her presentation today, it in a way is uh, related or, 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 or uh, touches upon the last uh, chapter of that wonderful book. Uh, Sara, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for that nice, uh, lovely introduction. Can, can you hear me? Just let me know if uh, it yes. cuts out. Yes, okay. Um, great. Let me just share my presentation. I just have some images um, that I wanted to show. I, I can't put it full screen, otherwise I won't see my notes, but uh, this should be okay. Um, yes, yeah, so as you mentioned, um, this talk is part of a new project that I'm thinking about that kind of builds on the end of, of the last book that I published. So um, while I was writing that book, which focuses quite a lot on Egypt's political economy in the 50s and 60s and tries to think about whether um, Nasserism constituted a form of hegemony, uh, this, this, this new project is also interested in Nasserism, but more broadly and how Nasserism lives in the present. So um, thinking about uh, Nasser as a ghost or almost the project itself as something that haunts the present, um, not only in Egypt, but across the Middle East and North Africa. And part of this project is also really interested in how we can think about um, anti-colonial archives. So while doing my previous work, I mean, there was a lot of um, state archives, there were a lot of archives of um, Arab Marxists, for example, that were very useful, but I found it interesting that still there's so little that we have if we want to think about um, archives of anti-colonial struggle, as, um, and this is at least in, in the Middle East and North Africa. And so a lot of what I'm interested in now is what does it mean to think about anti-colonial archiving? Um, is it something that we want to necessarily create? What, kind, what would this mean um, for archives? Um, are there more radical ways that we can think of um, the past through kind of the way it lives in the present? Mm -hmm. And connected to this, I'm also really interested in how anti-colonial archiving opens up um, the possibility of exploring connectivity in more interest in, in really interesting ways. So, um, and I'll talk about this in the talk, but one thing that I've been particularly interested in is how we can think about Egypt in relation not only to the Middle East, 
as is often the case, but also to the rest of the African continent. So recovering some of those histories of anti-colonialism that actually tied Egypt to um, the rest of Africa. And what kind of archives would we have to look at if we wanted to recover those histories? And I'm really excited to be here because I think the connections between Egypt and Eastern Europe um, are obviously connections that existed and were very strong. So we do know that they uh, were really momentous and really influential on the way Egypt's project of decolonization unfolded. But again, there's so little that we know about them. And I think partly this is related to language, partly it's related to archives being separated into different national spheres. But also I think it's uh, in large part to do with the disciplinary disconnection. So post-colonial studies tends to really focus on only some regions of the world. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to talk about what it means to um, start to break through some of those disconnections and think about um, maybe anti-colonial archiving as one way of doing that. So that's just a really uh, long introduction to what I'm about to say, but um, I'll start now. So this talk basically comes out of this interest in how anti-colonial pasts express themselves in the present and what this might mean about how we think about the future. Um, I'm especially interested in how we can explore anti-colonial pasts through traces and fragments that have inscribed themselves either into the materiality of space or into popular memory or popular history. So thinking from the vantage point of Egypt, I found that the anti-colonial moment of the 50s and 60s is both absent and present in everyday life today. And this absence and presence is often mediated through fragments of ideas, emotions, attachments, or images of what the past had promised. If we think of this as an anti-colonial archive, it becomes clear that it's made up of things that are very difficult to archive in any tangible way. Um, these are things that are uncontainable within files, rooms, buildings, or libraries. Equally, I'm interested in the haunting quality of anti-colonial memory and how this haunting is experienced in the present. So how do these traces or memories or um, emotions gesture towards alternative pasts, but also to alternatives that might still exist? And how does this disrupt the heaviness of the present? So, like I said in previous work, I explored Egypt's anti-colonial moment from a very different vantage point, which was more thinking about political economy um, and the coming together of the first post-colonial state project that was led by Gemal Abdel Nasser, who of course was one of the major icons of global third worldism. The Nasserist project was formed in the 1950s against a backdrop of intense nationalism that had animated the country for decades. Various radical movements had already articulated many of the ideas that would become attached to the Nasserist moment. And tragically, the Nasserist project also had the effect of de-radicalizing some of these ideas and social forces. The project itself was centered, um, like many post-colonial projects, around independent economic development, welfare, industrialization, national capital, aiming primarily to break with the infrastructure of extractivism that had defined colonial rule. This project also emerged at a particular historical moment, which was characterized by third worldism, non-alignment, pan-Arabism and pan-Africanism, and was very much part of the global socialist imaginary that was dominant at that moment. I think it's very difficult to overstate just how crucial this context was for projects such as Nasserism, which conceived of themselves as both national and international, and had, I think, a very particular understanding of uh, the importance, of course, of national um, territory in relation to independence. But at the same time, I think there was a very particular idea of anti-capitalism that necessitated some form of South-South solidarity that was, um, that we, as we know, didn't mit quite materialize. And I mean, just to give an example of this type of, um, these types of connections, if we think about one of the watershed moments of Nasserism, which was the nationalization of the Suez Canal in order to build the Aswan Dam. Um, we know, of course, that the Aswan Dam was very much a project that was influenced by um, Soviet engineers who were very um, heavily involved in it. And actually, there's an amazing Egyptian scholar, Alia Mosallam, who's done oral histories 
with uh, some of the workers that built the dam. And they talk quite a bit about their memories of the Soviet engineers that they worked with and also um, how they how different the Soviet engineers were from the American and British ones. So it's quite interesting, again, when we think of how we can start to to put together these um, these historical connections. So just to say again, I think there is so much more to know about these connections, especially between Eastern Europe and, and the Middle East. So while I think this work is really important, especially around political economy, what I want to focus on today is more the figure of Gamal Abdel Nasser himself, and in particular representations of him across time and space and the uncanny feelings that these provoke. So in Egypt and across the Middle East, but also beyond, images of Nasser appear every, almost everywhere, in the back of taxis, on the walls of small cramped shops, and occasionally in street protests. We often only see fragments, many of them, many of which show just enough of his face for us to know that it's him. Some are in black and white, some are in color, some show a young smiling general, some show um, an older statesman. So this is, these are the types of traces that I'm, I'm really interested in thinking about. Um, and I use them to explore a series of questions about how Nasser haunts both Egypt and the broader anti-colonial moment in the region, suggesting a different way in which the past comes into the present. So other than obviously the institutional, economic, um, social and political legacies of decolonization, can we also understand um, this haunting nature of Nasser himself as an afterlife of decolonization as well? And some of the ways that this I try to do this is to think about how these images and where they appear also tell us maybe about different histories of anti-colonial connection um, and what that might help uh, how that might help us think about archives um, a bit differently. And this image is from Beirut. So there are a lot of um, I don't know if anyone's been to Beirut, but definitely one of the cities where you Nasser is, is everywhere. So in the rest of this talk, I touch on three lines of thinking that might bring out some of these significations. So the first is an, uh, thinking about these images themselves. The second is the faded but ever present history of connectivity between Egypt and other parts of the African continent. And the third is an analysis of how the figure of Nasser exists as an evocation of a past that never quite materialized. And here I think a little bit about how strikes, workers who have gone on strike in Egypt often recall Nasser in an attempt to critique neoliberalism. Before that, I want to touch very quickly on the idea of traces and thinking about um, archives in particular. So in Sorry, I think I got muted, but I hope everything's okay. Um, so in his work exploring Soviet African technologies and histories, Asif Siddiqui traces a history of connection through Soviet technical artifacts that were left in various African sites. And he notes that the retelling of the story of the connection between the Soviets and Africa, um, African liberation movements today is very difficult because it's a story made up of absences where very little of the archival record remains. And he uses the term Soviet African modern to, re to refer to the entanglements between these two spaces, but also to um, a similarity in how these two spaces understood the future at, the, at this particular moment of decolonization. Um, and he writes that for both the Soviets and many of the African um, liberation movements, they understood time as uh, that historical moment as a moment that was about to be rather than one that already was. And so in many ways, um, thinking about how different parts of the world at that time were thinking about the future produces what he calls connected chronologies. So um, this kind of uh, shared vision of some kind of futurity was an interesting way in which um, connections were being made at that time. But more importantly, this article talks quite a lot about the lack of archives or the lack of traces that can tell us more about the Soviet African modern. Um, he looks at some of the telescopes, so a lot of the article looks at telescopes that the Soviets had placed in Mali, Somalia, Egypt, Sudan, and Chad. 
And he asks, how can we explore the deeper legacy of this type of entanglement when its archival imprint has been fragmented, lost and disappeared? What do we do when these actual infrastructures have disappeared? Um, and how can we both make space for the fact that these archives are both incomplete, confusing, fragmented, but also that they're very real and that they have a lot to tell us? Um, and importantly, there's also a political motivation for us thinking more carefully about these archives and understanding them as real, even when we can barely see or touch or feel them, in that they all gesture towards a different understanding of the future. Quote, Soviet ideology of the time was invested in a new model of the earth, one that was revolutionary and proletariat. Similarly, many Africans were seeking to reshape the world, both the world that they inhabited and the world that they envisioned in the future. This co-production of possible futures was manifest in these astronomical stations that we see across the African Sahel and gazing towards the heaven, the heavens, end quote. So this idea of the co-production of possible futures is an idea that speaks to both the broader project of pan-Africanism and third worldism, but also to the materiality underpinning um, many of these types of connections. And in this case, literally in the form of telescopes, astronomy stations, factories, and more. And I think for me, what I found really productive about this particular um, article is that on the one hand, they, he focuses on this idea of unbounded aspiration and the co-production of futures. Um, and on the other hand, he is trying to grapple with the incomplete materiality. And perhaps this is where uh, anti-colonial archiving becomes really interesting because it really pushes us, I think, to think beyond the kind of traditional archive in so many ways. Um, it also invites us maybe to think about speculation, about um, fiction, about all these other ways in which we could tell these stories that we know took place, but we still don't know enough about because of how how much has disappeared in the meantime. So that was just a small note to kind of think about what what the challenges of anti-colonial archiving are and now how I've thought about maybe particular traces that could be really interesting to think about. So um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about the face of Gamal Abdel Nasser and how it appears around different parts or different cities. Um, and this image, like I said, is from Beirut, but you can really see these posters in a lot of different places. I think here you can see one that is barely uh, visible, but you kind of can recognize it just because there's so many other similar ones that are less damaged. So I'm interested in thinking about what these types of images mean when we see them in the present. Um, can we understand this appearance of Gamal Abdel Nasser in the present as gesturing towards alternative pasts or even perhaps alternative futures that are still imaginable? The ghost of Nasser is still with us in many ways. And while military power or economic policies might be one path to understanding the ghost of the past, um, perhaps these representations, posters, street names, people's names are another way. There's something powerful and disruptive, as well as deeply nostalgic and troubling when these specters appear in the present. They rarely ever dominate the landscape. The posters are always faded or hanging off the wall. The street names are names that we've memorized and we might not even be paying attention to. The photographs are always surrounded by other photographs and sometimes you only see him if you're looking very carefully. But to me, it's, the, it's this dimension of these representations that they are barely visible that makes them particularly haunting. Focusing on Bahrain, Talal al-Rashud has written an article that discusses the presence of photographs of Nasser on the walls of homes as well as public spaces across the Gulf. He writes, quote, at an antique market, I asked the dealer if he has any photos featuring Abdel Nasser. Shaking his hand, he says, those sell very fast and fetch very high prices. He still has his admirers in Bahrain, end quote. Al-Rashud goes on to describe his surprise when he entered a government building in Manama to find a portrait of Nasser on the wall, saying that it felt like a throwback to the 50s and 60s. Someone he interviewed said there have even been cases where the ruler's photograph has been removed from classrooms and Nasser's photograph has been put up instead. 
Like many other parts of the region, Nasser was a popular figure in Bahrain during those decades, transcending political doctrine to become a broad cultural phenomenon in the Gulf. What's of interest here is the question of the image and what it was imagined to represent. Al Rashid notes that the image of Nasser was a symbol onto which millions of people projected their hopes and dreams. It stood for a shared consciousness of what the future could and should be. And he says, quote, it can safely be said that no secular symbol has unified as many people in the region before or since, end quote. With this comes some sort of symbolic power that also translates into an effective register. And, and these, this, these are some of the images from Bahrain. I don't know if you can see, but he's just over here by the window. So I imagine that these appearances of Nasser in the present invoke um, haunted histories of pan-Arabism and Arab nationalism, as well as non-alignment and third worldism, haunted not only by the defeat of 1967 to Israel, which marked a, a turning point in the region, but also the shift to neoliberalism, the emergence of oil markets and the turn towards the US. For writers like Al Rashid, Nasser's popularity in the Gulf is connected to the role he played in anti-colonial and leftist liberation movements. The boundaries between nation and global blur here through the suggestion that it's impossible to understand Nasser past or present without understanding him across different geographies. I also wonder whether the invocation of Nasser in the contemporary Gulf especially by leftist scholars and activists might also do the political work of critiquing the present without explicitly formulating it that way. In a piece on representation, Leopold Lambert writes, if through representation, something can acquire more value than what its essence normally allows, no limits can be drawn to restrain the same value. Through the projected symbolism onto Nasser that Al Rashid describes, the tensions and contradictions of the figure dissolve or at least are decentered. How might we think more carefully about the memory work embedded within these textures of anti colonial figures in the present? In an article on statues and memory, Rahul Rao suggests that the post colonial canon is aging. This aging, however, doesn't preclude the turning of this canon into a ghostly one, and recognizing this means we must continually reassess the central figures of this canon. Rao write, wrote this in relation to Gandhi, um, and in particular the need to revisit Gandhi in light of the troubling racial politics that he was involved in during his 21 years in South Africa. As Avery Gordon reminds us, ghosts are here because they represent unresolved tensions. They point to holes in the social fabric, suggest moments in our neat nationalist histories that may not be as pristine as we like to think. Here, I want to think of it in reference to Al Rashid's point that the image of Abdel Nasser was a symbol onto which millions of people projected their hopes and dreams. It stood in for some kind of shared consciousness of what the future could be. In this sense, the continuing appearance of Nasser in spaces like the Gulf, as well as Lebanon, Palestine, and many other parts of the Middle East, speaks just as much to a critique of the present as to a nostalgia of the past, um, all the while gesturing towards a future that had once seemed possible and was now and is now increasingly slipping out of reach. So I'm going to turn now to the second I, uh, type of trace that I've been thinking about, which is street names. Um, and please just uh, message me if I'm going over time, because that happens a lot. Okay. okay. <laughs> so um, I'm going to think about street names primarily in relation uh, to this question of Af Egypt's connectivity to, to the rest of the African continent. Um, and I start in Lusaka, Zambia. So this is a map of uh, Lusaka. And this I start here just because this is where I grew up. And I remember growing up always wondering why there were these roads called Cairo Road and Nasser Road. I always found it really interesting, a really interesting um, connection to this place where my, you know, my family was from, but obviously I didn't necessarily think about why these street names existed. And in Lusaka, like many other cities, I guess, around the world, you really have these collection of streets named after anti-colonial figures. You have um, Suez Road, Tito Road, Gandhi Road, um, Nasser Road, Lumumba Road, as you can see here. 
Um, and I think there's something really interesting about these naming practices and how and how people maybe think of them in the present. So Karen Till, for example, has written about the political struggles over the spatialization of social memory and how we can think of street names as um, a battle over whose conception of the past should prevail in the public realm. So obviously a lot has been written about street naming practices um, and especially in Europe, now in relation to streets that have been named after colonial figures or colonial um, or people who are involved in the slave trade and so on. And here I want to think a bit more about these street names that are named after anti-colonial figures, especially in the global south. So I think a lot here uh, with a project that's entitled Avenue Patrice Lumumba, and this is an image from that book, in which South African artist and photographer Guy Tillem travels across Southern and Central Africa in search of traces of Lumumba in the architectural landscape. Describing the project, he writes, quote, these photographs are not collapsed histories of post-colonial African states, but a walk through avenues of dreams. Patrice Lumumba's dream, his nationalism, is discernible in these structures if one reads certain clues, as is the death of his dream in these de facto monuments. How strange that modernism, which was against monument and past for nature and future, should carry memory so well, end quote. In a moving review essay of this book, Leora Maltzleka writes that looking at these photographs, it seems that for every dream of revolutionary struggle, there is an avenue Patrice Lumumba. As Tillem finds and refines Lumumba's ghosts, um, his photographic essay draws together these dispersed avenues into a spectral cartography of liberation, end quote. Calling avenues and streets that have been named after Lumumba avenues of dreams, Tillem gestures towards the utopian future while capturing the momentous emotional registers of anti-colonialism and decolonization. And this is a photo of um, the there are there are two streets named after Lumumba in Egypt. Um, this is the one that's in Cairo. So from the vantage point of streets in Egypt, we also see these similar traces of connected histories. Um, in a post written about Lumumba Street in Cairo, Amira El Wakil notes that this street was actually initially named after Jean Baptiste Kleber, who was a French general involved in the colonization of Egypt. When it comes to streets named after Lumumba, Egypt has not one but two. In Alexandria, um, Nasser actually renamed a street after Lumumba as well. And this was, in fact, the same street on which the Belgian consulate could and can still be found, which means, of course, that until today, the consulate has to include Lumumba's name in any and all correspondence, um, which I thought was very, very cool. <laughs> um, and this is uh, an image of the protest that happened in Cairo uh, when Lumumba was assassinated. So what I find really interesting about this, these traces is that these names invoke a faded history of Egyptian African anti-colonialism that focused on Congo and the assassination of Lumumba. For instance, following this assassination, massive demonstrations broke out in Cairo during which the coat of arms at the Belgian embassy was replaced with portraits of Lumumba, which we can see here. Lumumba's children were, were also able to escape from Congo and actually were taken to Egypt after Lumumba had asked Nasser earlier to take care of them um, if anything happened to him. And, and they were actually brought up um, in Egypt. So what I'm interested in here is what happens when we place Egypt and Nasser within the framework of African anti-colonialism, which might seem um, a stranger idea today than it did 50 years ago. As noted by Jehan et Tahri, the placing of Egypt has traditionally been within the history of Middle Eastern anti-colonial projects like Pan-Arabism, a placing that I think is also dominant within popular memory inside of Egypt. It seems to me there is a need for more work that thinks through Egyptian anti-colonialism in relation to the rest of the African continent. Um, that also is not necessarily a nostalgic or romantic history, but that also pays careful attention to the fissures and fractures that have often created North Africa as separate um, from the rest of the continent. Um, and here again, I wonder if these types of traces or these types of anti-colonial archives are one way in which we can start to think about um, alternative connections that obviously were very important at the time, but that since 
have kind of faded from view as we have gotten much more used to thinking of particular regions in relation to one another or relation to themselves um, only. And I want to just share a really great project which has started to do this. So this is a, it's a project called the Archive of Forgetfulness by Hoda Tayyob and Bongani Kona. And they, um, this project is also an attempt to think through archives, memory, and history across the African continent. Um, and in particular, what it means to disrupt the supposed barrier between North Africa and what is problematically called um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So the figure of Nasser in Africa then, um, in this instance, through streets named after him or through streets named after anti other anti-colonial figures in Egypt, can be read as one of these traces signaling what some have called an Egyptian African story of anti-colonialism. Like I said, this is not necessarily a romantic story and it's not a story that is just about solidarity. It's also a story that is full of contradictions and tension that speaks to the politics of racism within North Africa, to histories of the um, Arab and, uh, slave trade across the continent, and to histories of how cities of Cairo became central spaces of anti-colonial imaginaries. An Egyptian African story is a story that might recenter both histories of anti-colonialism as well as histories of connections and disconnections between spaces such as Egypt and Zambia. As Sophia Azeb has notes, when we place North Africa within the story of Pan-Africanism, uh, Pan we can understand this history through the idea of an uneven commitment to Pan-Africanism. But when we do this, we also open up the possibility of telling very different stories of this, this third worldist moment. So how much time do I have, just so I know if I can do this last bit? <laughs> It would be it would be good if you could wrap up in let's say five minutes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll just very briefly summarize the the last section, and I'm happy to talk about it more. But basically, this was looking at how Nasser has and his ideas um, have been mobilized by especially by workers in the strikes that led up to the 2011 revolution. So. Um, especially in the 90s and 2000s, there were uh, millions and millions of workers that went on strike. And I think this is a massive kind of precursor to the 2011 revolution. So what's interesting is that often workers mobilized um, the project of Nasserism in their critique of neoliberalism. And in particular, they very much uh, were demanding a return to something. And I think this something was often articulated as a moment in time where independent economic development and some kind of um, some kind of guarantee by the state that it would take care of workers okay. that of course over time particularly from the 70s onwards had completely been eroded and so i tried to think about how actually neoliberal restructuring which began very early in egypt um, also has has very much brought out the ghost of nasser in its intensification of economic inequality but also that it's quite interesting in in that it's almost that because nasserism as a project was unfinished that it's able to to haunt the present and i think there's something really interesting about time and temporality when we think about the unfinished nature of these projects. Um, it's almost the, that they were interrupted that becomes very important in how they live in the present, rather than had they continued and failed or had they not started at all. And I, that's something I really would love to think some more about. Um, but yeah, I'll stop here because I think otherwise I'll just go on forever. Um, but yeah, I hope this was interesting and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Sarah. It was very interesting, really important and interesting lecture that was uh, closely connected to some discussions that we had yesterday and some initiatives also uh, here in, in uh, Yugoslavia in, in, uh, reminds us <laughs> um, of, of the project the colleague Anna Knežević is working on at the Museum of, of African, African Art. Um, but what I find the, the, the most uh, interesting and motivating 
it's it's of course this notion of uh, co-production of possible futures, which I think could be applied on rethinking the the transnational connections and entanglements within the within the non-aligned movement and in relation also south south. Um, but uh, I will now ask uh, uh, the, the people ask the, the people to put their questions and whether do we have a, any question over Zoom? No, okay. Thank you, Sarah, for your uh, amazing talk. Um, a question that really, uh, that, I mean, the thing that stirred my mind, uh, like Liliana's, was about co-productions of the futures, but also uh, when you talk about anti-colonial archiving, the difficulties and how we live with these memories and, you know, the whole thing, uh, you know, present, past, future. Um, I wanted to bring, I mean, yesterday we mentioned it briefly, but maybe just to kind of tease out um, the people who are here, uh, how do you see, I mean, specifically now, uh, the situation in which we have uh, certain countries that were formerly part of the non-aligned, like former Yugoslav Republic, such as, for instance, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where I come from, which has, as of recently, become the only um, former Yugoslav country where there is uh, a solid, concrete facility aimed to host uh, migrants coming from Egypt, from Pakistan, from not only Syria, but Middle East, North Africa, Southeast Asia. And how do you see these encounters in the peripheries happening between these former uh, nations uh, that once had these dreams of freedom, like, you know, the Patrice Lumumba sense that you mentioned? Uh, how do you see, uh, I mean, today, strangely, is the 51st uh, anniversary, uh, or, uh, well, it's, it's I think that on this day, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser died, if I'm not mistaken, so this is very coincidental that you bring him up. And how these memories of the former, let's say, leaders and their visions uh, live among newer generations who are now escaping, fleeing war, poverty, uh, extractivism, exploitation on their way, and they're becoming stuck in the Balkans and yet again, can we relive, can we, can we bring this into connection? Can we now think of new futures now that, for instance, uh, strong international organizations like IOM are managing it, that peripheries have be become places where people are either fleeing away from or have become these reservoirs of bodies uh, to be managed by, you know, the organizations who are managing them, such as Frontex, IOM, of which we are very critical. How do you see past and the future uh, colliding in the peripheries with respect to, to, to everything that you've said. I mean, just a comment. I know you haven't done research on it, but maybe just um, your two cents. Thanks. Um, should I answer one, one by one? Question? Okay, should I just answer each question individually? I can, I can answer yes. this one. Yeah. The way you choose. Great, yeah, thank you for that uh, great question. I mean, I think, I think in some ways, um, what I found quite difficult about writing about this topic is uh, the present itself. Um, it's almost a bit easier to write about the past and to write about the future that this past was imagining. Um, and I found it much more difficult to think about what the present tells us about um, the possibility of this future actually materializing. Uh, this was especially the case, obviously, writing this um, in the aftermath of 2013 in Egypt um, and really thinking about uh, not avoiding the question of how what happened in the 50s was related to what was happening in 2013. So, yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. Um, <coughs> I think that the, uh, the story that you mentioned, obviously, of people uh, having to leave their homes in many parts of the global south um, is a story both of, I guess, the contradictions and the limitations of what post-colonial states try to achieve or 
uh, in many ways, the, the failures, I guess, that we could ascribe to some of them. And also, I think the very successful counter revolution that we saw in the 1970s uh, of not only neoliberal restructuring, but also I think it's really fruitful or productive to think of, of that counter revolution as a counter revolution against anti colonialism. Um, I know it's often framed in this language of uh, capitalism versus socialism. But again, for most of the global South, socialism was anti-colonial anti -colonial and anti-colonialism was socialist. And I think what we're seeing today, particularly around the crisis people are facing um, in many parts of the world that produces these form, flows of migration is precisely the uh, intensification of this counter-revolution that is not only about um, neoliberal restructuring, which of course happened in many parts of the global south very early, but also um, completely crushing, I think, this idea of a different type of way in which people could connect with one another. And I think there's something quite interesting also in some of the debates that are coming out now around human rights, because in many ways this is the tension of are we understanding um, migration and the right uh, the right to asylum, the right to free movement from this perspective of human rights, or are there other ways in which we can understand um, movement and solidarity? And I think here, it, it seems to me that we've really, or at least I'm not seeing a lot of the type of language that we might have seen some time ago, which was more around uh, what kind of future do we want to build together? So not, um, sorry. Um, so not necessarily this idea of uh, we have this, which I guess you see much more in Western Europe, that we have to give people safety, you know, very limited numbers of people safety, but more how are we globally connected in a way that's producing very uneven forms of exploitation and what does this mean um, to what solidarity actually would look like. So, yeah, to me that's... A very difficult question to think about in the present because it seems to me we're very far away from those types of discussions. I think uh, it's the language, especially the language of human rights uh, in its liberal version, seems to me still a very dominant framing through which we understand our collective responsibilities to each other. And I think here it would be really interesting and important to look back to this anti colonial moment where. Again, it wasn't necessarily this romantic idea of solidarity, but actually an understanding of this, these entanglements and an understanding that this co-production of futures is the only way in which those futures could actually come about. Um, I know this was very broad, but I hope it speaks to that. And just to say as well, I think uh, in relation to Eastern Europe and the Middle East, uh, it's it's been really fascinating coming across these little bits of archival information about how many, for example, Egyptian students went to study in, you know, various parts of Eastern Europe. Um, but also how they understood that uh, versus how they understood going to study in the US or going to study in Britain. And I think those types of uh, understandings of what it meant for an Egyptian to go and study in Eastern Europe in the 1950s are so different from what you've just described, right, which is uh, a very different type of flow. But I think it does also speak to the, the intensity and the severity of the moment that that we're in today. If that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Hi. Hi, Sarah. It's Paul. Thanks so much for an inspirational presentation. Um, and of course, I really now wish you could have come partly because, as Liliana said, there were lots of points of connection yesterday. But it also would have meant that I could have given you that photograph that I showed you where Tito takes a photograph of NASA and NASA is filming Tito. And it does seem to me that there's something here, even going, going along the lines of your ideas of the co-production of non-alignment between, you know, the friendship of Tito, Nasa, Nehru, and Kruma, and Sukarno, and so on, and how much that, that actually mattered. But my question is actually about co-production, because um, my, my slight worry, 
and it, it, I mean, I'm being serious here, it is only a slight worry, is that this can sometimes seem like the great men theory of history um, through the analysis of figures like Tito and Nasser and Nehru. And perhaps what that might mean, there are two things that that might mean. One is the kind of not quite enough emphasis on the complex co-production of anti-colonial thought within and between each of these countries. So I always say that my work on non-alignment, it really allows me to see figures other than Tito in Socialist Yugoslavia as incredibly important in terms of the thinking and the action and the praxis of this. But the second, of course, is that it's men. You know, the five founding fathers of non-alignment were men. And therefore, I wonder in a sense, and obviously you've, you've thought about this, were, what this does to kind of, what this notion of the image of a male leader does to kind of thinking about feminist histories. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I, I really wish I could have been there as well. Um, I think that's such an important question, and I think it also ties into this issue of archives, um, because even within anti-colonial archives or radical archives or third world disarchives, uh, they also produce their own margins and their own exclusions. And I think um, what's been really interesting is one of the courses that I teach is on the anti-colonial archive. And this is always one of the conclusions that students kind of come to uh, the quickest, which is that there's this initial excitement about third worldism and, and you know, the posters and the films and the letters and the Bandung conference, but uh, very quickly it becomes clear that this, there's still only certain figures that become overrepresented, even within what we might call these quite radical archives. Um, but it does raise this question of uh, if we want to tell different stories of anti-colonialism, which of course we do, how does that also push us beyond anti-colonial archives as we know them themselves? And where else do we then need to look or what else do we need to think about um, to, to also talk about the critiques that were happening in, in real time? And I think uh, some of my work that's looked at Egyptian feminism from the 50s and 60s, uh, very much was about how feminists already were articulating a critique of the post-colonial state, even as it was being formed. And so this is not a critique that came afterwards. It wasn't a critique that even came after the excesses of um, Nasserism, for example, but it was a critique that was there from the very beginning. And I think what's uh, important about those critiques is that they also are pointing to actually a very different form of futurity. Um, and so even when we think about the co-production of futures, um, what what futures do we mean? And there are, there were just, I think, I think there were so many futures that were open at that moment, not only just this future of post-colonial freedom or anti-colonial liberation. Um, and I think in some of the work that has looked at Nasser, it becomes really clear, not only the, the connections to masculinity and, um, especially to post-colonial masculinity that we really see emerge at this time through the idea of freedom fighters, the idea of this, these new statesmen, uh, the connections to the military. I mean, these were all military generals in, in many parts of the Middle East, but also I think in the invocation of mastery and um, very particular masculine and quite colonial in some ways ideas of what politics actually looks like or what politics means. And this was often through this language of mastering uh, nature, whether we look at these infrastructural projects and the way they were thought of or mastering the future, mastering the self. Um, and this is a very different language than what we see in other, other anti-colonial trends at that time. Uh, another place that I'm really interested in and that I think also brings up this question of archiving is, uh, for example, the Nubian Nubian resistance to the Nasserist project, especially after, of course, the building of the Aswan Dam displaced, you know, so many Nubian communities. And they also articulate a very different idea of what freedom looks like, which is not the dream of 
an independent Egypt with huge infrastructural capabilities, but actually a much, uh, you know, a place in which people are connected to land in a very different way. Um, again, I think with uh, with these these spaces, the question of archiving then becomes really crucial, but also really, it, it's a really sensitive one in the sense that not all groups also want their archives necessarily to be open or, yeah, or that these questions of accessibility, I think also become important, not in whether we can access them, but in whether we should, especially since so many of these uh, archives are still very politically sensitive in the present. So. Yeah, I would, I mean, I would love to talk about this more because I think this is where, how we think about archives and what we can and can't um, find also determines very strongly the figures that become really central in the, in the histories that we're telling. Thank you. Please just state your name. And Hello. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, this was a fascinating talk, and I really appreciated the way you dealt with the complexity of the past, present, and future, and the embedding of one into another. Um, before I go on, I also want to mention there's never a reason to apologize for a cat joining a Zoom call. Um, but uh, yeah, so my question actually deals with nostalgia, and in particular, I noticed some very strong parallels with the kind of nostalgia you were discussing with the nostalgia that we certainly have here in the region. And um, what, what I'm curious about is, I've at least here in Yugoslavia, um, there are two very different kinds of nostalgia. And I don't even know if um, the, the, the term nostalgia can be used for both or if we need new terminology for this. But the first is a kind of crude nostalgia of looking back at the past as some kind of golden age, where it's something we wish to return to. You see this particularly with, um, let's say, ethno-nationalism of going back to some great medieval period that never really existed. And the second kind is more of this nostalgia that you find in, um, kind of in Bosnian folk poetry in Sevdalenka. It's this idea of returning to a past that's problematic. And the reason for this is wanting to return to a past that was problematic in order to address the problems differently, in order to create a different present than we have now, to go back and not make the wrong turn that we made. And in this sense, I'm curious what kind of nostalgia you, you saw with Nasser, if it's this kind of you know, glorification of Nasser as you know, a golden age, or if it's specifically um, looking back at this period as problematic and seeing that there were other futures that were once possible that for whatever mistakes that were made no longer are, and in this way is a critique of the present. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. And actually, um, in this project, I also think a lot about nostalgia because I think what's really fascinating about somewhere like Egypt is that different people are nostalgic for de very different historical moments and often that's very closely related to class. Um, so for example quite a lot of Egyptians are also nostalgic for the not necessarily the colonial period but that monarchy period in the when we had, you know, um, a king, and it was kind of still under British occupation, but not really. Um, but this period of kind of almost colonial liberalism, and this is often, I think, a nostalgia that you find in much more uh, elite circles. Whereas, often with the Nasserist nostalgia, it's very much tied, I think, to um, again, for many of us, including myself. Uh, families who were only able to access things like education or jobs or employment because of those reforms that happened in the 50s and 60s. And that's where you find not necessarily, I think, a nostalgia for a return, but some kind of almost um, 
almost like a soft spot for this moment in which obviously it became that their lives changed and in a way a recognition that this would not be possible today or is not going to be possible for their kids or grandkids and so i think that's quite interesting i think overall what's what's what i would say is that i there isn't a very strong nostalgia for Nasser inside Egypt over, overall. That would be my sense. I've seen a much stronger nostalgia for Nasser in other parts of the Middle East, which is really interesting. And I think in some ways, that's the nostalgia you pointed to. That's the, almost the crude type of going back to this golden age of pan-Arabism. Um, and I think it's very much tied to this time when uh, Arabs were also united in support of Palestine. Um, it was a time, obviously, of, of uh, a very different economic system. So I think that's quite, it's interesting to me that that exists almost more strongly, especially in leftist circles and other parts of the region. Whereas I think inside Egypt, it's not, I think a lot of what's happening today, people also see as connected to what happened in the 50s. And I think this sometimes prevents this really crude type of nostalgia. But I think your second type of nostalgia is really interesting. And like something I've been thinking about is also melancholy, um, uh, which has meant that I've had to read a lot of psychoanalysis, which is uh, fascinating, but also it's a lot. But um, I, I'm really interested also in this idea of something that can't be grieved or something that there hasn't been a reckoning or a processing of what was lost. And so in some ways, these emotions in the present are a consequence of that inability to actually mourn for something. And I mean, I'd be interested to hear if that speaks a bit to the second type of nostalgia, almost in the sense that how can we go back? We don't want to mourn this yet. Um, how can we, but we also recognize that something went wrong and how can we go back and change it or do it differently if we if we had if we could do it in the present and so yeah i wonder if also melancholy is an interesting uh, way of thinking about some of these complex ways in which people are emotionally relating to that to that past because it doesn't have that romanticism i think of nostalgia but it does have this feeling of being stuck almost um so yeah those are just some some initial thoughts um, Sanya, please just <laughs> let me pose one small question before, uh, because it's, it's in a way it's connected to this one. I wonder about um, that effective life world that was created around Nasser and how how much it it does affect still his presence, however haunting, in Egypt now. And also, I, I would I would like to. No, whether I, I, I can understand that that affective world created around him was certainly closely connected to that perhaps the most important symbolic gesture of nationalizing Suez Canal and later on building uh, Aswan Dam. But how 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 much he or or the, or people around him invested in in facilitating. And, and constructing that effective life world that was sur surrounding Nasser. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a great question because I think this is something that I really miss in a lot of the work on um, decolonization in relation to things like Marxism is there, I think, of course, the political economic dimensions of de uh, decolonization are really crucial. But to me, I think the power of those projects was a very, uh, very much also effective and that the contradictions of those projects, therefore, became clear much later than I think they would have without that type of effective life world around around projects like Nasserism. Um, I think what's really fascinating about Nasser is that even today, uh, when you kind of talk to Egyptians, people have a very strong effective response, uh, either love or hate, but it's very rare that someone will just be like, oh yeah, he's okay. Um, 
And I think that that is interesting. I mean, this is kind of a very big afterlife of Nasserism is that there's very strong feelings attached to his memory or his ghost or his his project in the present. And I think that's what initially got me really interested in this idea of affect and, and decolonization. Um, I think partly this was to do with that historical moment. I think it was a very effect, a highly effective moment in general. And I think Anita Khanu, for example, has this book that's just come out, The Visceral Logics of Decolonization. There was obviously a viscerality and a very clear emotive um, power uh, to what was happening at that time that I think would be really interesting to, 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 to that for more work to look at. At the same time, I think these projects also cultivated that, like you were, like you were saying. I mean, Nasser himself, if we look at his speeches, um, his uh, the way he spoke, the type of language he used, the way he dressed, uh, the way he presented himself, there was such a clear appeal also to a very part, a very effective type of relationship that he wanted people to have with him. Um, and people have written really great pieces about, for example, the letters. Everyone felt they could write Nasser a letter, for example, um, and that it would get to him and that he would read it, uh, which I think is really interesting. It's an interesting idea, given that obviously he was very popular. Um, but also, uh, people. there was a really great article, I forget, who it's by, but I'll try and put it in the chat, about Nasser at Bandung and how out of all the kind of post-colonial leaders that were there, he was the one that crowds just went crazy for, but also that he knew that and he really put on a performance as well, which is also tied, I think, to this question of masculinity. So um, I think, and, and I was also thinking about the radio station, Voice of the Arabs, I mean, there were so many channels through which this project uh, tried to build hegemony, not just through, I would say, the economic or the political, but very much through this invocation of nationalist um, affect in particular. So I think, yeah, there's so much more to, I think, think about in relation to how emotions were part of that moment, because I think it's often these emotions that we're seeing in the present or fragments of them, or that the afterlives are also emotional afterlives. And I think as affect studies has shown us, I mean, emotions are never just responses to politics, but they also produce politics. And that's why I think it's really crucial to unpack how these emotions are, what they're doing in the present as well. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, uh, Sonia Horvatinčić from Zagreb. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, thank you for your uh, really great, inspiring lecture um, and for the amazing photo material that you shared with us. Uh, I was wondering if we could go a little bit back to the topic of archives um, and uh, if you could tell us more about how you understand uh, the mobilization of traces and memories that you mentioned, the materiality of the past in relation to the construction of futures. Um, in terms of what, on the one hand, how are people taking part from below to building uh, a new kind of archive? Or how do you understand this process? Is it a, is it a process of counter-archiving? In which, in which terms is it related to um, uh, the institutional West-centric understanding of the archives? Uh, and on the other hand, what is the role of scholarship uh, in this task? Um, is it, uh, from your perspective, um, legitimate to intervene in this process in, in, and in which way? Thank you. Yeah, I think those are really important questions to think about. I mean, I think definitely, uh, I mean, a lot of my thinking on this has come out of teaching this course um, on the anti-colonial archive because I think that's also pushed me to really think about what an archive is. And actually there was a really, uh, uh, problematic <laughs> article that came out recently, I think by like a white British man historian who was saying uh, we need to stop calling everything an archive. Um, but I think we actually should should really expand what we mean by what an archive is. And I think that once we start to do that, we also see that a lot of what we might think of as uh, archives are not archivable. 
So that's been an interesting discussion that's come out of the class is how do we think about things like um, smells or other sensory feelings or things that we might experience and we, ima we, we connect to um, an experience of the past, but that we can't actually archive when we think about archives in this very traditional way of collecting or uh, keeping in place so that we can come back to it. So I think one thing that has been really interesting is also what the process of archiving means. Um, I think it's easier to say everything is an archive than to also think about what is archiving then? Um, how do we archive? Uh, and do people want to archive? I think uh, I'm always reminded of an indigenous feminist from Canada who wrote, uh, Dion Millian, who said, some things should stay around the kitchen table not everything, and she's talking here explicitly about academia, not everything should be written about in academic work. Um, not everything should be archived for outsiders maybe to see, but that some forms of knowledge, some forms of memory, some archives should just be for maybe families or indigenous communities or um, people, again, who it might be, it might be at risk if these archives become public. So I think all of these questions are really uh, crucial to think about in relation to how we archive, what an archive looks like, and whether academics should intervene. Um, and I think this is very closely related to knowledge production, to ethics, to how we also think about our, who are we accountable to um, when we write, and who's are there people who maybe want this to be out there? Are there people who might not? And, and how do we make those decisions? Um, and just to speak to this point about how people are building archives from below, I think this has been such an amazing, um, there's been such an amazing wave of this, at least from what I've seen in Egypt. So people doing popular history workshops, um, again, Alia Mosallam, who I mentioned, it was really crucial as, as part of this movement but also things like family archives, intimate archives. And I was really struck how during, at the beginning of COVID, so many people I knew began doing oral history uh, projects with their families, like their grandparents, their great grandparents, because I guess it was a moment in which the fragility of everything, I think, became so clear. And so I think this is something that at least from my experience is happening much more. And I think those types of uh, attempts from below are really, really important. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there another question? Hi, this is Anna Devich, sociologist. Thank you for this um, multi-layered talk. My question is about the present also and related to some extent to one uh, um, a relationship to nostalgia that comes out from your talk. What is the, the disjointed relationship, if there is one, between the um, reflections about Nasser and the past um, and the official representations of that period in um, the school books and in the official um, speech, um, whether it is only on ceremonial or uh, on a more regular basis, and whether there are differences across um, Africa. You mentioned, obviously, some instances of official representation, such as um, naming streets, um, but uh, can you give some other examples of what can we um, see about that the relationship between the official and less official representations of Nasser and the related past. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, so I think in the context of Egypt, uh, especially in school books and other official spaces, uh, and I think this is why in, in some of my work I've said, you know, Nasserism clearly was hegemonic in so many ways, because I think he's not only represented or celebrated as obviously this important figure that liberated Egypt and the, the, the Middle East, but also we can see that every political project or leader that has come after Nasser has had to somehow 
position themselves in relation to him. Um, whether the, like with Sadat, it was against him or whether what we're seeing today, uh, it's uh, as a continuation of Nasserism. So I think there's an interesting way in which um, the power of, of Nasserism as this per, Nasser, especially as someone who liberated the nation, is what uh, the official story is to the extent that um, today we still, we, yeah, we're, we're still seeing attempts by people in power to align themselves with the Nasserist project. I mean, I read a really fascinating uh, point recently by Omar Khalifa, who said that actually there's not a single statue of Nasser in Egypt. And to me, that was really telling as almost, you know, there is no need for it. Nasser is everywhere or he's, he's he is that kind of founding figure of the nation. So I think there's it, it's really interesting how actually that negates the need for these types of monuments. Um, but your point about the rest of Africa is interesting because I was thinking about how uh, when I was growing up in Zambia, for example, people remembered Nasser very positively. And I remember clearly some conversations where people would say, oh, that was when, or someone once said, you know, that was when Egypt under, thought it was African, you know, and uh, a clear uh, a clear point about how this changed later and Egypt now considers itself not to be part of the African continent. And so there's something also interesting in how people's everyday memories of Nasser in other parts of Africa are are, are also uh, quite positive in that they gesture towards this history of share a shared commitment across the continent that I think today is a much more fractured idea. Um, but I think another, so I think that's one avenue in which we can kind of trace represent, or memories of Nasser that are not official is through like people's um, family archives, through people's memories, just through, uh, especially so much of that generation is still with us. I think another interesting way of um, tracing these things are also, is also the question of migration and diaspora. There are actually quite big diasporic communities of Egyptians, for example, in Southern Africa. And I think this is such a uh, interesting space because many of those migrations happened during the 50s and 60s and are actually tied to some of the projects that Nasser initiated. And so, um, and I think it's interesting because when we think about diaspora, we often think about uh, Arab diasporas in the West, um, you know, in Europe or the US. And it's almost as though diasporas in other parts of the world we just kind of um, don't know a lot about and I think that includes also Middle Eastern diasporas in Latin America in Eastern Europe because I think those uh, flows or those types of why people went there how they went there and the example of you know the many students that went to Eastern Europe that and I think many actually stayed you know and tell us also very different histories of connection that I think are, are, are super interesting and very different, I think, from the official kind of narrative. So I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. Still another question? Thank you very much, Sarah. My name is Ljubica Spaskowska. I'm a historian from the University of Exeter. Um, I, I've seen reports from Bandung and how Yugoslavs reported on Nasser uh, enthusiastically and his principles on economic reform and the support for Palestine as well. So thank you for mentioning that. My question is about this sense of deglobalization that is very present now in the region. Uh, that sense that once upon a time we played a disproportionately uh, huge role in international national affairs, together with Egypt, of course, in discussing economic decolonization, uh, you know, uh, um, peacekeeping in Egypt as well, where Yugoslavia played a huge role, and now this sense of peripheralization. Uh, I was just wondering whether there is a similar sense in Egypt uh, that there is this retreat uh, from that internationalism or that international scene, or that's something more particular to the Balkans. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think definitely. I think uh, 
I think there is a retreat from a certain type of internationalism. So certainly the internationalism that we associate with the Bandung moment, um, that again was an internationalism very much connected to uh, third worldism, to also maybe more socialist based types of economics. Um, but also an internationalism that was very much found, founded on South-South uh, solidarity. I think that retreat, at least in the Middle East, happened quite early, um, unfortunately. In Egypt, in the 70s already, we were seeing this turn away from um, non-alignment towards an alliance with the US. Egypt was, I think, one of the first post-colonial states in which the IMF um, were able to sign an agreement. So already then we're, we're seeing this shift away from these types of international, that type of internationalism. But I think what's important is that it, it turned, I think another type of connectivity emerges, especially with neoliberal restructuring that is very much tied to things like trade, um, uh, things like markets, export markets. So just to give an example, uh, what we're seeing in Egypt today is actually a very clear uh, attempt at creating links with the rest of the African continent. But when you read these types of reports or interviews, these are explicitly uh, within this language of um, opening up new markets for Egyptian products, for Egyptian labor. Um, how can we basically uh, exploit kind of um, Egypt's power in the region? So those i think and that is i guess for some a type of uh is a way of being oriented internationally but again very dominated by i think this language of um of neoliberalism and especially financialization and this is something that i think people like adam hane have done really amazing work to show how places like the gulf have been so crucial in producing this type of um interconnecting of Africa and the Middle East through their investments, through their um, buying of land, land grabbing, all of these things. So I think there, there has been this shift. I don't think that necessarily there was a turn away from the global, um, but obviously a very different idea of what global um, connections should look like, I would say. Thank you. Any other question? We have questions in Zoom. Okay, I think that we can wrap up this session. Uh, thank you, Sarah, very, very much for uh, taking part in this workshop. It was a great pleasure to spend this morning uh, listening to your talk and in conversation with you. And I hope that sometime during this project we will have opportunity to meet you in person in Zagreb or in, or, or in Jekan, uh, at some of our events that we are plan planning to organize uh, during the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions.
Live? Oh, we are. Gosh. Uh, thank you for the temporal dislocation when there were messages that we might start at 12.30, but we're actually starting close to 12.15, as was in the program. So we'll have time for the three presentations and discussion. And this panel is anti-colonial antinomies and afterlives, so it's the AAA panel. Um, and we have three excellent uh, presentations, one uh, here in Rijeka and two via Zoom. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first speaker who's with me here now, Sasha Slacek berlek who is a research associate of the Social Communications Research Center of the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University of Ljubljana in Yugoslavia. Uh, his main research interests include critical political economy of communication, labor process analysis, as well, well as theories of public opinion and the public sphere. Recently, he's been focusing on global communication inequalities from a historical perspective, particularly, and this relates to the lecture today, the history of the New World Information and Communication Initiative and the work of the McBride Commission. And one of the really important elements of the non-aligned movement was the non-aligned news agencies pool. And Sasho will talk about this as a case, and the title is Decolonizing Culture. So Sasho, welcome, and the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Paul, for that introduction. But first of all, um, before I start, I'd like to ask how many of you are familiar with the term uh, the all red line? Nobody. Well, that's great. It's, a, it's an informal term refu uh, used to refer to the network of telegraphs that uh, spanned the globe and connected the British Empire. Um, and I think it's a really great you know, representation of how empire building you know, and the building of communication uh, infrastructure go hand in hand, which is of course not specific to the British Empire. You know, it goes back to the Roman or even pre-Roman times and it's uh, true to today. Uh, so that's why I think um, the question of decolonizing um, um, culture is a significant topic and uh, I've decided to address this uh, through the, the uh, non-aligned news agencies pool. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I want to focus on the development of non-aligned cooperation in the field of information and communication in the period between 73 and 79, uh, because this was really the period of uh, intense, you know, uh, institution building uh, within the non-aligned movement, and it was also the time that the pool was uh, born. Um, and focus particularly on the, the pool for reasons I will uh, explain shortly. Um, so the sources uh, are, you know, of course, from the archive of Yugoslavia, the cabinet of the president of the Republic, Tito, uh, the Federal Executive Council, the relevant commissions of the League of Communists, as well as the Socialist League of Working People, uh, as well as the Federal Secretariat of Foreign Affairs, which is not yet in the archive of Yugoslavia. Missing, uh, as you might notice, are the Federal Secretariat for Information. I haven't yet been able to access that, so hopefully in uh, next year. Uh, and also Tanyuk, uh, but sadly, as far as I know, those archives if we were talking about, you know, internal documents, meetings, and so on, are, as far as I know, lost, sadly. Uh, so there, there's a gap there. Um, and in my presentation, I will first focus on the um, context in which the poor was born, uh, then the phase before um, the pool, how uh, it got started before it got started through cooperation of Tanyuk with other non-aligned uh, news agencies, uh, the launch of NANAP and its institutionalization within uh, the non-aligned movement, um, and finally how uh, it operated, um, and then hopefully wrap it up uh, within 20 minutes. Um, so this is a picture of uh, uh, the communications uh, equipment Tanyuk used in the uh, 60s. Um, so the context uh, is, you know, the, as I already mentioned, the, there was a lot of institution building in the 70s within the non-alive movements, and a part of that forms of informational cooperation. Uh, the Intergovernmental Council for Information, the pool, 
cooperation between broadcasters, system of information and research, uh, information center on multinational company, companies in Havana, as well as the documentation center, uh, which really never came to be, sadly. Um, while these two, the system of information and research and information center, were really concerned with exchange of economic information and analysis. So, um, and as a media scholar, I'm really looking at these first uh, three forms of cooperation, which were distinct, you know, in this ter term that they were cooperation between uh, media. Um, so why talk about NANA specifically? Uh, well, it was the first form of information or cooperation and really the blueprint for other forms like the cooperation between the broadcasters. Uh, so everything really grew out of um, the pool and from Tanyuk's initiative. So that's why I focus on the pool specifically. Um, so the goals uh, of the f uh, pool were a few. Well, the first was to increase information exchange between uh, non-aligned countries and you know, specifically in, in terms of news exchange to fight the unbalanced global information flows, which were seen as a legacy of uh, the colonial past, particularly you know, through the global dominance of the so-called big four global news agencies, all of them Western, uh, of course. So in the sense, the goal was to decolonize news. Um, and also, a, another goal separate from this was to influence reporting on NAM in the Western media. Um, you know, Mila yesterday uh, mentioned, uh, you know, Jürgen Dinkel and his paper, you know, on the significance, you know, of the news and the trying to influence global public opinion for the non-aligned um, movement. And the pool was a part of this. So the goal was not only to increase information exchange within the non-aligned movement, but also, you know, to have Western media uh, take up, you know, these news items and when they are reporting on the non-aligned movement. Um, so here's just an illustration, you know, there were many studies going back as far as the 70s. This one was done under the auspices of UNESCO, so UNESCO played a significant role here uh, by Karla Nordenstreng and Tapio Varis, really demonstrating how this is about the flow of television con uh, content, how it flows from you know, the US, you know, as the singular, you know, superpower uh, above all others, and then, you know, from uh, the former colonial powers towards uh, poorer nations with very little information flow in the other direction, and also very little information flow between uh, the poorer nations. Um, so you have this web, you know, flowing from the superpowers and the, the former colonial powers. Um, so, uh, as I said, you know, there were three phases to the creation of uh, the pool. First, it started with not really connected to the non aligned movement, but through Tanyuk's bilateral uh, agreements. Uh, then, ta then the pool was now launched at Tanyuk's initiative in 75, and only after that, in 76, came the formalization and institutionalization within the non aligned movement. So, we see that the practice really existed before it was institutionalized and formalized. Um, so, in the first phase, you know, very quickly after the war, Tanyuk started concluding uh, bilateral agreements. Uh, it, they had, you know, the standard commercial ones with the global um, agencies, but for the others, the smaller European, Eastern and non-aligned, they tried to conclude barter agreements. So, sort of a pre-modern, you know, uh, mode of uh, exchange, not, not monetary, but, you know, just exchanging news for news. And this is a, a picture of their uh, uh, cooperation with news agencies in 63. And you, you can see that it's very much focused on Europe. You know, there's very little in Africa, nothing in, in Southern America, just Prensa Latina, the Cuban uh, news agency in Latin America, I think. Um, and also Asia, not, not that much. Uh, they also had aid agreements, uh, which are often part of these barter agreements. Here you can see uh, uh, the conclusion of the agreement with the Ghanaian uh, news agency, GNA. Uh, a, a part of this, Tanya loaned them um, equipment so they could. It was not entirely philanthropic because this equipment was needed to receive Tanya news and send news to Tanya back. Um, and, you know, as I already mentioned, Tanyuk really had limited coverage of non-aligned countries, uh, even by the end of the 60s. So by, by 68, they had 31 agreements, but only uh, but 15 of, 
of those were with Western um, European news agencies. So you can see that Tanya was very much focused on Western Europe uh, at this time. Uh, and the network of correspondents was similarly, you know, focused like, you know, their course uh, uh, agreements with news agencies, mainly on um, Europe. Um, now, this changed during the 70s because, well, the world um, changed. I cannot go into detail, uh, but in my view, it is, has mainly to do with the crisis of U.S. hegemony, and this also led to uh, a reorientation within the non-aligned uh, movement. So you have a kind of re revival of uh, NAM in the 1970s, starting with the 1970 uh, Lusaka conference, then the Georgetown uh, ministerial conference, conference in 72 and the Algiers uh, summit in 73. And a key part of this revival was economic cooperation, which was uh, kind of set out in principle in Lusaka and then operationalized uh, at the Georgetown. Um, and we can see, you know, this informational cooperation really fitting into this uh, move towards institutionalizing economic cooperation within the non aligned movement. Uh, so, at the Algiers summit, you know, not only were there calls for a new international economic order, but it's the first time that within the non aligned movement, culture is uh, mentioned as well, the effects of imperialism on culture, as well as a program to strengthen exchange of information between the mass media uh, within the non aligned movement. Here, in a you know, very, I would say, economistic and technical perspective. So there were no philosophical discussions, you know, about the nature of, you know, how is colonialism shaping our minds, but it was really, you know, about uh, getting faster and more efficient communication and contact between uh, non-aligned news media. And uh, these formulations in the uh, summit documents are most likely at the initiative of uh, Tanyuk. I can't, don't have time to go into detail, but you can ask in, in the discussion if you're interested how I got to that conclusion. Um, so then NANA was launched in 75, that's two years after um, the Algiers summit, and at that point Tanyuk had concluded bilateral agreements with 12 other news agencies from non-aligned countries, so still not a whole lot, and a lot of these were done at the end of 74, uh, you know, as a part of this push to really launch the pool. Um, so it started work in January 75, and it was coordinated by Tanyuk, so not really a non-aligned project at that time. Um, it was preceded by diplomatic activities, so the Secretariat for Foreign Affairs was involved, mainly it facilitated contacts between uh, Tanyuk and other news agencies where Tanyuk didn't have contacts before, and they also sought statements from non-leaders and kind of pushed those that were reluctant. This just I threw in some names, but there were many more, so they tried to get as many as possible to kind of open the pool with a bang, you know, all, all of the non-aligned leaders would uh, give statements in support of the pool, um, and this would start off its work. Um, so initially, you know, after seven months, there were already 24 participating agencies and the information service of the United Nations. Uh, shortly thereafter, also UNESCO joined. Um, so it was really an early success, and this shows, you know, that already at this point they were looking towards, you know, including the United Nations as, as much as possible. Um, and several countries voiced the intention to form national news agencies in direct response to the creation of NANAP. So there were diplomatic telegrams from embassies, you know, saying, well, this country, they said that now that the pool exists, they, they will uh, form a national news agency in order to be able to take part into the pool. So really, this early phase can be thought of really as a, as, as a big success. Um, so after it had already begun life, you know, as Tanyuk's project, uh, it became institutionalized only after that within the non-aligned movement. There was a meeting of non-aligned information ministers and representatives of news agencies in New Delhi in 76, uh, where the NANAP constitution was adopted and coordinating bodies, the coordinating council was named. Uh, India took over the journalists from India. Uh, Mankekar was named as the first coordinator of uh, the pool. Uh, and you know these findings were then ratified, these documents were ratified at the fifth summit in, in Colombo in 76. Later, later that year. Um, so how did the pool um, operate? 
it was a news exchange mechanism. So it was not a standalone news agency, which really fit, you know, in, into this whole ethos of the non-aligned movement. So we don't go for centralization. You know, we're all equal. We rotate functions and uh, so on. Um, Tanyuk was at this point, you know, the, the main coordinator. So they gathered news from other agencies in three languages, translated them, and then redistributed them to other agencies. But they also included them in their domestic and foreign news service. So these are the two goals I mentioned. So for one thing, you know, strengthen exchange within the non-aligned movement, but also, you know, try to get this news placed into, uh, you know, the world media outside of the, the movement. Um, and, you know, it, it was based on a barter system, so they didn't pay for the news, but everybody contributed their news items into the pool and everybody could take each other's items um, out of that, so, which was kind of a way of, you know, stretching limited um, resources and was uh, continuing the practice Tanyuk had already established, you know, during this, the 60s. Um, but, you know, soon after this initial success, several limitations became um, apparent. Um, one was that the news items, a lot of the news items that entered the pool were of low quality. So, linguistically, you know, grammatical errors and so on. Uh, but also in terms of journalistic standards, which had a lot to do with, you know, extremely limited funds of many of the participating uh, agencies lack of technology, lack of trained um, personnel. You know, many, many of these countries were struggling with hunger, you know, so really news, news production was not high on their uh, agenda with their <laughs> distributing funds. Um, so Yugoslavia tried to uh, help with those through different ways. One was that the Institute for Journalism in, in Belgrade was organizing these short introductory courses uh, for journalists from other non-aligned countries. There was aid in the form of equipment and technicians, but of course this was woefully inadequate, you know, compared to what would actually be needed, you know. So what Yugoslavia could provide was, of course, not adequate to what was actually needed, um, uh, especially in the poorer countries. Um, Another limitation was, you know, that what was uh, referred to as in a critique from the embassy, uh, Yugoslav embassy in Mexico, that the media were, were complaining about an official perspective uh, in the news items, so a lack of autonomy from state institutions um, of a lot of these participating news agencies, and some of them weren't even independent news agencies, some were government information uh, services. Uh, so that was a problem. And here's a telegram from the Yugoslav embassy in uh, Jakarta, which says, uh, for now our orientation is that news from non-AMP member states should not be hostile to other non-aligned countries. So there was this problem, you know, when it moved beyond this cooperation between news agencies and became a non-aligned thing, now it was, of course, a diplomatic thing, you know, you could not, could not say everything. So things that were included into the pool were already, you know, kind of semi-official statements of, of states. So you couldn't say anything and this kind of limited the, the operation of the pool. Um, and this, of course, you know, especially with the ambition of, you know, penetrating especially into the Western media, this was a problem. Um, this and, and the, the normative role of journalists as socio-political workers, this was the Yugoslav formula, formulation, was really at odds with Western understanding of journalism. Now, this is not to say that the Western understanding of journalism is valid, uh, but Tanyuk had the ambition, of, you know, of penetrating into Western media, and this was a real problem, you know, this clash of uh, perspectives. Uh, and the Western media were overwhelmingly hostile when the pool was formed. The reporting was, well, this is just, you know, a plot to limit uh, freedom of expression. Um, and, you know, politic politicization. So, for example, uh, in India, you know, Indira Gandhi had, you know, a very precarious relation with power. Uh, at this point, you know, she declared a state of emergency in 75 um, and so on. And this, you know, really affected how the news media in India um, looked at the pool because it was her initiative, you know, she was in support of it. But, you know, she was at the same time imposing censorship, closing media and so on, uh, which didn't make the pool really 
didn't really help the pool among Indian news media. Um, and also another example was that, you know, in the run-up on or to the 79 uh, summit, Arab states were pushing for Egypt to be expelled from the non-aligned movement because they believed they had Egypt had betrayed the Palestinian cause. And this then led to the question, well, okay, but can the Egyptian news agency participate in the pool? So the pool meeting had to be postponed after the 79th summit because this question had to be uh, answered there. So all of these political issues then really negatively impacted the work of the pool. Um, this is another picture of you know, the receiving equipment uh, from Tanyuk, just uh, as an illustration. Uh, so to wrap it up, uh, the pool really grew out of Tanyuk's practice of collaboration with non-aligned uh, news agencies, and really Tanyuk here plays a central role. Not even so much, you know, uh, the Yugoslav government, it was really the, the news agencies that pushed um, these policies, and particularly here, the, the, the key person was uh, the director of Tanyuk at, at the time, Pero Ivacic. Um, on, and this, you know, push of Tanyok fit into this drive to institutionalize economic cooperation with, within the non-aligned movement at the time, um, as well as a desire to develop communication infrastructure you know, within these countries and to break the dominance of Western information sources. Um, however, after this initial success of setting up the pool, several limitations became apparent and you know, they plagued the operation of the pool even, you know, to its bitter end. Um, and I think that this pool kind of points, you know, the fate of the pool points to the paradox of self-sufficiency or oslanjene uh, na sobstvene snage, as it is known in, in, in Yugoslavia. You know, where poorer countries would try to pool their resources to gain independence, but even when they pooled the resources, as was the, the case in the pool, they remained collectively poor. Uh, so they had to rely on outside aid. In this case, you know, I didn't talk about it, but a whole nother, you know, presentation would focus on how they tried to get UNESCO involved and get funds from um, UNESCO. So the paradox was that self-sufficiency was really reliant on outside aid. Um, so that's it for me. So thank you for your attention. Here's a, the picture of the first editorial board of Tanya, which was set up in uh, uh, at, at the second AUNA Congress. Um, and I think it really, you know, kind of ties into this presentation because it is what set up, it had the dual purpose, first of all, to inform the nations of Yugoslavia about the liberation struggle, but also to inform the international audience, uh, which is also its goal, you know, in, in the 70s. So thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Sasha, for a really, really brilliant um, description and analysis and lots of points for discussion. I was going to thank you for absolutely sticking to 20 minutes and then you put that wonderful photograph on and started talking about it. So I'll almost thank you for that. But, but um, we shall come back to lots of points in discussion. Uh, the next speaker, I'm delighted to welcome Zoltan Ginelli who is an independent researcher. He's a critical geographer, historian of science and global histories. He works on geographies of knowledge, world systems analysis, and histories of geography, colonialism, and racism, with a focus on the historical relations between Eastern Europe and the global south and the, or the third world. He's currently working on two books, one for Cambridge University Press with James Mark, who was with us via Zoom yesterday, and I really hope you're here now, James, I can't see, and Peter Apo, about the global histories of Hungarian relations to colonialism and anti-colonialism in the long 20th century. It will be a bestseller because it's entitled Che in, che in Budapest, Hungary between the colonial and anti-colonial worlds. And Zoltan also has his individual book project based on his doctoral research about the global histories of the quantitative revolution in geography. Zoran's presentation is on the Hungarian race for anti-colonial recognition in the third world. Zoltan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, uh, I shared my screen, so I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Okay, thanks, because we haven't checked, but I'm happy that it works. Uh, I'm so happy to be here, even though online and not in person. Uh, apologies for that. I was supposed to come in person, but 
I ended up here at home. Uh, I just like to dive into my presentation because I have throngs of slides and just because of the visuals and some film material that I'd like to show you. Because most of my research is based on quite dense archival research and some interviews. What I'll try to show you here is a Hungarian case study, which is, consists of three episodes. Uh, so there will be sh three short episodes. And what I try to show with these episodes is the different ways that Hungarian intellectuals and politicians tried to race for an anti-colonial recognition in the third world. So it's about the post-war period, but there are important interwar era uh, uh, origins of these trajectories, which I try to show that these uh, political trajectories diverge after uh, coming from a shared political origin connected to the peasant movement and the smallholders party. Okay, uh, so the three case studies will be the first, the anti-communist refugees who fled from the uh, Rakoshi regime and Sovietization. And my main figure here is Ferenc Nagy, who was the uh, first prime minister of the third Hungarian uh, Republic. So he was a, uh, uh, as a refugee, he was a very important person as a premier. And, uh, and the second is the 1956 revolution, where there was a revolutionary moment for socialist reformists and of course other ideas of reformism uh, to, um, to uh, again, build up some sort of a democratic uh, alternative to what was before the Sovietized uh, uh, version, the Stalinist version of communism. And at this moment was also about reaching out to some non-aligned countries like India to mediate, to help mediate between Hungary and the Soviet Union, which is largely forgotten. And the third one is uh, my main character is Jozef Bognar, who was a development economist, and he was responsible for various um, commissions in Ghana by uh, Nkrumah, which included the development of the, the construction or creation of the first seven year plan of Ghana. Uh, and so you have the so-called communists, so-called socialist reformists and anti-communists who were, who were all from in the interwar period from the 1930s on from, connected to this tradition of the folk riders, uh, this uh, um, movement for agrarian reform and also the development of the peasant movement or peasant union in Hungary and also then later on internationally uh, and all of them were connected to the smallholders party. Istvan Bibo was uh, actually responsible for the new administrative uh, reform of Hungary uh, developed by the uh, smallholders party people. So he was also connected to Ferenc Nagy. Uh, Arpad Guns uh, became uh, later important as uh, the first president of the uh, Third Republic of Hungary up to 1989. He was a young student at that time, uh, also connected to Bibo. So let's paddle forward. And the first episode is, uh, is about actually this question, was there a Hungarian Bandung? And I try to argue that there was in the sense of how Hungary is connected to and tried to influence the Bandung movement. Uh, the Bandung conference in 1955 uh, and this developing non-aligned movement. In this short video, you saw Ferenc Nagy arriving at USA as a refugee in 1947, fleeing from Stalinization. Uh, there's some literature on this subject. And what I just tried to point out is that Ferenc Nagy is largely missing from these histories. I won't go into details of reviewing this material, but I'd like to point out the wonderful work, work of Anna Mazurkiewicz, who has been helping me in my research. She writes about Ferenc Nagy, but she doesn't really go deep into the Hungarian materials. And she doesn't point out the fact that uh, Ferenc Nagy, uh, or at least touches lightly upon the fact that Ferenc Nagy was responsible uh, uh, for influencing the Afrasian conference at Bandung uh, by bringing in the argument of Soviet colonialism uh, and arguing for 
uh, accepting into the, con the resolution of condemning colonialism worldwide that was accepted at the Bonn conferences to include Soviet colonialism into this resolution. Now, it was not concretely included, but it was generalized in a way so that it could be included. And uh, let's talk a bit about Ferenc Nagy. So he was politically active already from the 1920s. He was the founder of the Smolders Party, uh, also the Hungarian Peasants Union. He was prime minister of Hungary, as I said, and resigned to Switzerland first, and then later settled in the USA. And he was one of the founders of the Hungarian Committee of these anti-communist refugees, and also the assembly of you, uh, member of the an important member of the assembly of European captive nations. And he tours uh, Asia in the mid 1950s, and also he has some trips in 1960s. I focus on the mid 1950s because, okay, uh, because that was when the Bandung Conference uh, came up in 1955. On the left, you can see one article by one of his former associates. The only actual source where in Hungarian language, uh, I think this was published in 1991, uh, discussed. So it's totally not discussed in Hungarian history. And, uh, and I could try to show some of my you know, archival research, which is based in, uh, at Columbia University. And this was part of the Socialism Goes Global project led by James Mark. Uh, so I, I went and digitized 12,000 uh, pages of documents. And I also have authorization from the uh, uh, still living twin sisters of Ferenc Nagy to digitize the whole collection, which consists of approximately like 150,000 uh, pages of documents. Uh, so uh, there's also like his Asia trips notebooks, notebooks, various, uh, uh, he had lots of lots of notebooks, he wrote a lot. And also there are audio graphs of di audio discs that uh, are waiting to be digitized, also cassettes of his important speeches. So there are various materials we could talk about. Uh, now, anti this whole topic is connected to the anti-communism at Bandung, which I think is largely de-emphasized by uh, these memories or memory politics, which largely focus on, when it comes to Eastern Europe, largely focus on Yugoslavia. There's some Yugoslav uh, centrism or Yugocentrism, but also uh, this kind of socialist understanding or memory of this history of non-aligned movement. Uh, but it's largely the emphasis of the anti-communist trajectories. And uh, of course, uh, Ferenc Nagy connected to these trajectories by trying to influence Sir John Kotalavala, uh, the Chinese prime minister at Bandung. Uh, Sir John Kotalava had this speech which was, uh, you know, ended up in great turmoil and great debates and surprised Necru and some others who were trying to, you know, introduce China into the whole discussion. Uh, so there is another form of colonialism, however, about which many of us represented here are perhaps less clear in our minds and to which some of us would perhaps not agree to apply the term colonialism at all. Think, for example, of those satellite states under communist domination in Central and Eastern Europe, of Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Czechoslovakia, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Poland, are not these colonies as much as any of the colonial territories in Africa or Asia. And if we are united in our opposition to colonialism, should it not be our duty to openly declare our opposition to Soviet colonialism as much as to Western imperialism? So my argument here is that actually, Ferenc Nagy was largely responsible for uh, influencing Kotlava into this direction of making this statement. Uh, here on the right, you can see uh, a telegram where Ferenc Nagy uh, sends his assistant to thank, uh, 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 thank Kotolavala for uh, his speech. And, and he supported, he, su he met uh, uh, many important attache diplomats uh, and sent Kotolavala uh, a document uh, prepared about uh, why this argument would be important, Soviet colonialism in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and as an ex-premier, he was importantly funded by the CIA through the Asia Foundation, and uh, the US foreign policy tried to use the, as, as, as these kind of tokens, these Eastern European 
important intellectuals to sort of uh, in these camouflage missions to intercept uh, the Bandung conference and you know to uh, put forth this argument. On the left, you could see well, a short documentary movie where this is discussed by his former associates. Okay, so he actually did three tours. First to the conference of non-members of the United Nations in Tokyo, searching for allies. And then there was an India lecturer tour about Soviet Polonism. Uh, then after coming back to USA, there, there was this preparatory uh, long three months trip during the Bandung conference where he visited the Philippines, Burma, Thailand, Pakistan, Ceylon, and India. And he did uh, lectures uh, such a, which had the title, The Effect of Soviet Colonialism in Europe on the Development of Asian Peoples. On the right, you could see a document where he thanked the Asia Foundation for their support. Uh, so some, you know, uh, leaflets, uh, from the conference of non-members of the UNO, which I think I put in because I think it's an interesting pre-context. Also his map of India, where he tried to indicate his uh, travels uh, for his three months trip and his notes, what comes after Bandung, where he put in all these eight points about, uh, which were largely in support of an American development aid to India, American uh, influence and this kind of liberal democratic uh, uh, capitalism, but with a uh, with a very strong focus on agrarian reform, he actually used the International Peasant Union to develop contacts, even in India. For example, with Professor Ranga, who was an important reformer there. Also, just some from newspapers, friends not arriving in India and the Philippines from the archives and the American propaganda in the New York uh, Times. You could see this map. Uh, depicting of the depicting the decline of Western colonialism and the expansion of communism since 1939 and the fear of communism at the Bandung conference. It was widely received and Francois's activities was in the press. What he tried to do is, as he wrote, I used the social, the, the anti-colonist sentiment to present the Soviet Union as a most brutal colonial power. And India should also include the liberation of Eastern European countries in the fight against colonialism. The Asian and African nations would make a serious mistake if they only demanded the liberation of the old colonies, but not the new communist colonialism. The old colonialism is currently being disposed. After the war, decolonization liberated 6,000 million people. Uh, this view must clearly come out from the Bandung resolution because otherwise the resolution against colonialism would become unreal. Okay, some his this document was about this uh, uh, several pages of uh, uh, the effect of Soviet colonialism in uh, in 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 Europe uh, connected to the Soviet. Uh, so th this this whole document was about putting forth this argument, uh, detailing um, Sovietization, and then what came after. Uh, interesting, the reception in socialist Hungary was. Uh, totally de-emphasized and did not even mention, did not even mention Ferenc Nagy. I'm not sure, no, whether this was because they did not want to accentuate his role or they had little knowledge of his actual activities. Uh, but it was considered, I mean, the, the Sir John Kotelava's uh, speech was considered as, a th uh, um, as something that behind of which is a third party sabotage. Uh, of the Asian African Conference. And of course, Ferenc Noy put forth through the assembly of captive European nations, this critique, uh, you can see these giant posters in New York, which was near the UN headquarters. Uh, also on the right, you could see, uh, this was Khrushchev in Indonesia on February, 1960. Uh, you could see in the description, this uh, parallel of colonialism uh, uh, the Western colonialism and Soviet colonialism in one picture. He also had plans for a second Afrasian conference uh, to do TV talks with African and Asian leaders. And he tried to use his position in previous talks to uh, further that. And also what's important, uh, develop Hungarian village research in the third world and establish an international village research group, which he would have led. 
Let's go forward. And I just wanted to mention another intellectual connected to his activities, Imre Kovac, also folk writer connected to the peasant movement, who actually developed this village research in Latin America in 1960 when he developed the International Center for Social Research. So we could talk about how this knowledge of in the interwar period was globalized through these activities. Uh, he also had uh, an Asian tour, uh, but I'll return to this later on in the second episode, which was about, as I said, the 1956 revolution, and I'm focusing on two important people, Ishvan Bibo, who was a sort of liberal social democrat, uh, and he's widely remembered in Hungary, all, uh, but uh, both of them were uh, uh, convicted and sentenced to life prison because of their activities in the 1956 revolution, Arpad Günz became, as I said, the president uh, of Hungary after 1989. Uh, what was important is that they tried to reach out to a very important uh, uh, diplomat or attaché uh, who was there from 1956 to 59, Mohammed Atavur Rahman. Now, interestingly, this uh, the documents connected to uh, uh, to his activities. There uh, were published in 2006. On the left, his recollections translated to Hungarian. Uh, and in the middle, you can see this book about the documents in the Indian Foreign Ministry about the 1956 revolution. So this became accentuated and in the, uh, uh, in the memory politics of Hungarian you know, national history, India remained an important uh, element. Uh, this is also because of this anti-communist uh, nationalism, which focused on the 1956 revolution, positioned India as a supporter of the revolution, uh, and also uh, uh, in in this case, what actually happened is that Bibel uh, drafted a memorandum which he wanted to distribute to uh, India Indian diplomats and from with the help of diplomats to Nehru and also to the Soviet Union. And the memorandum was about uh, choosing a socialist Yugoslavian version path of development, was also about non-alignment, about pacifism, and about reaching out to India uh, to help mediate between the Soviet Union and Hungary. Now, in the end, although there was strong support from Mohammed Atta Rahman, but not only Rahman, but uh, 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 but by uh, Krishna Menon, an important diplomat who was also present at the Bandung Conference in 1955. The Soviets totally are through this, and after their invasion, uh, these discussions stopped. Uh, on the left, you could see that there was also a documentary movie, actually two movies directed by Zoltan Bonta, in which you have interviews with some important people connected to this uh, episode. Uh, so Krishna Menon was also an important uh, person to mediate. Uh, some young pictures of the young Arpad Guns and also Istvan Bibo at that time. But there were other people like uh, Yula Germanus or Erwin Bakhtai who were both Orientalists. Erwin Bakhtai was in the, uh, both of them were Indologists. Uh, you could, and they really helped mediate uh, this message. And at that time, Erwin Bokhtai was in India. So he had an important role in India in putting forth this argument. So the anti-communists come in by uh, the fact that they tried to save Bibel and, uh, and Guns from a life sentence. Uh, uh, they were first, first, there was this fear that they were going to be sentenced to death, but in the end, they were sentenced to uh, life prison. Uh, for their activities. So on the left and the right, you could see these resolutions. On the left, you have from Inver Kovac papers, and on the right, uh, uh, a telegram by Ferenc Nagy, uh, reaching out to Nehru, who, who then met with Janos Kadar uh, uh, at a UN assembly and persuaded him not to execute these people. Uh, some, we could also talk about this memory politics that I referred to of, of uh, this, relationship between Rahman and Arpad Guns. Arpad Guns became a very important uh, um, political figure in Hungary, widely remembered in all of, our, of the political spectrum. And lastly, I just like two minutes for 
the third episode, which is supposed to be the communists, but Jorge Bognar, who's Perfect. on... You've got two minutes, okay. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Jorge Bognar, who is the second from the right on this picture, standing next to Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana and president. He also came from, as I said, a similar background of smallholders party and the peasant movement. Now, uh, the, an initial, a very important moment in the relationship between Ghana and Hungary, here I'd just like to mention that Hungary was one of the first East European countries to uh, accept uh, uh, in 1958, the uh, independent nation of Ghana. So this 1961 East European tour of Kwame and Kruma, he went during summer to Budapest. And there were not only these colonial parallels constructed by uh, the Hungarians and, uh, and then tried to persuade Nkrumah uh, to accept Eastern Europe and Hungary as a former, as a, as a, as a nation who is formerly colonized. And therefore we have something to share in common. They referred to German fascism, but also Habsburg rule and all others. But he all, this was also the moment where he was, he met uh, the work of Jozef Bognar who tried to, who became later on a very important, first he was a politician, later on very important uh, uh, academic, and read a little booklet which was about Hungarian planning uh, and economic development, which was published in 1959. And then Kruma decided to base uh, the seven year plan of Ghana on the advisory work of Jozef Bognar, who was invited in 1962. Uh, Bognar also founded the Center for Afro-Asian Research because of this uh, work that he did, and he became the director of the Institute of Cultural Relations. And all these uh, development strategies that they devised and they could come up with, they later on influenced this reform of the new economic mechanism in 1968 in Hungary, which is totally uh, forgotten. So here you can see this picture where uh, he is Bognar with his advice, with his assistants and Kwame Kruma. Uh, but there, then lastly, connected to Bognar was also Dula Kale. You can see Bognar and next to him Dula Kale, who was at that time the president of the uh, Council of Ministers. And why I wanted to point this out that there was also this movie based uh, on the uh, first delegation a Hungarian government uh, delegations round trip in West Africa in the end of 1962. You could see uh, there was in this movie, this movie is called Four Weeks in Africa. Uh, and you could see Bogna stepping out from the plane behind him. So he accompanied this trip. The second uh, mission was to West, uh, to East Africa and the Middle East. There was also another movie based on that. You could see a map of the trip. And I just wanted to share with you that there is uh, this movie, which was part of our exhibition project, the trans pre movement, which uh, could be shared in the end as a link and you could check it out. Uh, I did an analysis on, of this movie, which showcased the Hungarian activities in West Africa and importantly in Ghana. And uh, lastly, what I wanted to finish with is that uh, in Bognas case, the Center for Africa Research became a very important in academic institution based at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, which tried to opt for uh, export-oriented development in the world economy, uh, but it also was based as the seven-year plan was on this kind of models of agrarian reform and agrarian development. And during the new economic mechanism, the industrialization of the countryside was a very important uh, argument and a very important policy put forward. So. Here, I, what I wanted to focus on is that there was three very divergent uh, uh, paths. Uh, all three initiatives tried to open up to decolonization in Afrasia, but had different you know, political trajectories, although they were based on the same uh, political origins and political ideas, which were therefore globalized through this decolonization. So thank you very much. And more in the Q&A. Zoltan, thanks so much. And that was a great tactic, signalling that you were going to end. Um, um, and you've given us lots of uh, thought for the next movie night, um, and hopefully you'll be with us. Um, I also think what, what 
the three case studies together showed was bringing Hungary back in, of course, but also the importance of ag agrarian reform and the pe and peasants' parties. And the first one in particular, what Vijay Prashad referred to as the fact that there was a left bandung, a centre bandung, and a right bandung. So, I'm, as you say, there's lots to be discussed there. But I do want to move on to our third speaker, Anna Sladojevic who is an independent curator and art and media theorist. She studies museums as complex objects. And part of this is about the context of the Museum of African Art, the Veda and Zdravko Pecha collection, which we heard about yesterday, and the Museum of Yugoslavia, with emphasis on aspects of these, those institutions that are related to historical non-alignment. Anna defended her PhD dissertation, Museum as an Image of the World, the Space of Representation of Identity and Ideology at the University of Arts in Belgrade uh, in 2012. And Anna's presentation is the role of affect affective heritage of non-alignment in both decentering and perpetuating stereotypes in the representation of African arts. Anna, welcome from Belgrade, and the floor is Thank yours. You. Thank you, uh, Paul. I shortened my um, title a little bit. Um, and in this short presentation, uh, I would like to re-engage uh, in deliberation as to how do we treat uh, both in museum practice and uh, a wider field of knowledge production, uh, what I refer here to as the affective heritage of uh, non-alignment and anti-colonialism. Uh, my interest in reopening uh, this topic is partially instigated uh, by the two museums in Belgrade, as you said, uh, uh, whose work I followed for over uh, 20 years, the Museum of African Art, uh, the Veda and Dr. Zdravko Petr collection and the Museum of Yugoslavia, being increasingly referenced uh, in relation to non-alignment and anti-colonialism, including the two exhibitions uh, open this month um, dedicated to marking the 60th uh, anniversary of uh, uh, the 1961 um, Belgrade meeting. Um, now I, I come from the field of uh, curating and theory and my curatorial work and research were influenced over years by the theory produced by uh, critics and theorists of uh, African art representation. Therefore, there was this African art in, in the former title. Um, I relied on their work uh, in theorizing the relation of colonial versus anti-colonial. Uh, discourse specifically at the mentioned uh, Museum of African Art because it was founded around uh, the ideas of non-alignment. Uh, and uh, uh, that was that, that I did that for the purpose of my PhD, as you said, in theory of arts and media, and it was 10 years ago. And that was out of my wish. I was working at the time at the museum. My wish to find where these anti-colonial values are to be found. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Bottom right. Yeah, yeah, I, I know because I have many screens opened here, so I, I apologize. Um, uh, I, I'm afraid I will not be able to do we'll that with, because I have with that. To, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we should. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, uh, it's fine. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no, it's it's okay. Uh, well, the the point is that my work pointed out the discrepancy discrepancy uh, uh, between the Museum of African Art methodologies, um, uh, procedures, and representation on one hand as colonial or imperial, uh, and on the other hand a meta representational uh, discursive anti colonial presence. Uh, that in the meantime I redefined uh, as the affective heritage of non-alignment and anti-colonialism, borrowing the term affective heritage uh, from the writing of theorist of heritage, Laura Jane Smith. Uh, now I um, theorized it as the emancipatory potential of the Museum of African Art, uh, uh, now talking concretely about this, uh, this particular museum, as a counter discourse uh, to museum as such, as imperial device uh, that uh, continues to perpetuate uh, inequalities. This was then, however, and um, namely 10 years ago. And now I actually feel that we need to observe 
more critically this aspect uh, of representation as well. Uh, the question that I pose now, uh, therefore, is whether this turning toward non-aligned and anti-colonial topics can actually bring about the change of the imperial uh, paradigm of knowledge production, uh, one that is so profoundly inscribed uh, in all the segments of our, of our, of our lives, as Ashil Mbembe, Marina Grzinic, uh, Ariela Isha Zulei, uh, and many, many other uh, critics of representation have shown linking cultural representation to dire forms of inequalities, uh, bio and necropolitics. Or will they, as was the case so far, continue to perpetuate it. Uh, since this uh, affective heritage is, um, well, let's say all heritage is the matter of present and not past, is, it would be uh, erroneous uh, to think of it as somewhat undisturbed or continuous or even something out of our hands. Indeed, we, we, create, uh, we create it day in, day out, especially if we work in uh, museums or academia. Now, we are all aware that non-alignment uh, uh, as an idea and a set of values ha has been brought about um, and into academic spotlight after decades of obscurity. Uh, however, even though it was synchronous, um, it has not been, uh, at least from the museum perspective, uh, completely in tune uh, with uh, the ever-increasing calls worldwide for decolonization of heritage and representation. Uh, for me, one of the most telling examples um, of this deeply problematic relation between the two, uh, namely recuperating um, NAM spirit and the values of anti-colonialism, but at the same time observing critically uh, the existing modes of representation and knowledge production, uh, was a conference uh, proposed by, by my dear colleague uh, Katarina, uh, Katarina Zivanovic, who was at the time curator at the Museum of Yugoslavia. It was also a conference that I took part in organizing and moderating under the title uh, Non-Aligned uh, Museum <laughs> in 2016. Uh, the Non-Aligned in the title um, was actually meant to situate the theoretical thinking uh, of museum uh, within the context of non-alignment as an anti-colonial global political formation. However, uh, the discussion among international participants uh, revealed the illegibility of anti-colonial affective heritage beyond its immediate constituencies, as it was mainly discursive and not object-based, as well as a persistent refusal of such constituencies uh, to observe the more obvious colonial and imperial modes of knowledge production in both the Museum of African Art and the Museum of Yugoslavia, but in general in all of the institutions of cultural representation. Mm. More importantly, however, uh, there was no recognition um, at the time of the need to decolonize this anti-colonial affective heritage and this is actually the main point that I wish to make with this presentation. Um, well, the first level of my uh, criticism in my PhD was uh, theorizing uh, the very act of collecting as colonial activity um, and the museum as an imperial device as such, uh, or the permanent display and its ethnographization is perpetuating the imperial paradigm but the very manner in which it is organized. Now, however, I would like to move uh, the focus of my criticism precisely to the ways this affective heritage of non-alignment and anti-colonialism is being formulated and perpetuated. If nothing else, uh, the smooth appropriation by the governing elite in Serbia for the political purpose in the last uh, 10 years, and Mila showed some of it uh, yesterday, um, the exhibition in to, uh, 2011, suggests that we need to elaborate it beyond the scope it was initially created for. Now, let me give you one example from my practice. Um, that has to do with the relation between the colonial um, or imperial modes of representation and the meta museal anti-colonial affective heritage and my deliberate decision as a curator to emphasize one discourse over another. Namely, I was engaged by the Museum of Yugoslavia um, as curator working along my dear colleague, Mirjana Slavkovic uh, on the exhibition Tito in Africa, Picturing Solidarity in 2017. 
uh, pre-selected for this exhibition within uh, the Socialism Goals project. Uh, I know it has been already mentioned uh, today. Uh, the photographs from Tito's travels to African countries now part of the museum collection taken by, by four photographers working at the president's cabinet, uh, Dragutin Grbic, Alexander Stojanovic, uh, Milos Rashet, and Mirko Lovric, uh, presented the images of power um, that relied upon recognizable visual symbols, uh, which were particularly uh, evident in meetings at the highest political level. Now it is clear that photography is an imperial device with its imperial construction of the unobstructed uh, piercing entitled gaze and the possession of the moment that photography uh, suggests uh, of traveling and recording as normalized practice of scenographization of other people and countries, uh, confirmation of ourselves against the ethnographized backdrop, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these photographs, um, however, are not different uh, than most diplomatic photography taken at a time. Uh, however, not only within the working uh, process, but also in further reception uh, of their representation, they were sometimes seen as more uncanny, even more grotesque, uh, more colonial than the practice that established them in the first place. Again, it has to do with imperial hierarchies of power, as well they set the canon they also cast resentment over every dissented attempt at emulating it. This brings in another question of decentering the paradigm. In the case of this exhibition, the notions of uh, anti-colonialism, anti-racism and solidarity were deliberately put forward. It was a deliberate uh, curatorial decision precisely as a counter discourse that I mentioned earlier that served the purpose of balancing this almost painfully colonial imagery of this photographic collection. Now, I underlined already my curatorial decision about this exhibition in order to show how uh, each one of us uh, is taking part in uh, creating this, the, the discourse. As time plays a significant role uh, four years forward, namely now, I think that counter this, this counter discourse is again clearly visible enough to be criticized. Okay. So uh, regarding uh, criticism of the effective heritage of non-alignment and anti-colonialism, I, I will give you an example that I find particularly layered uh, as it impressively condenses most of the problems and dilemmas when it comes to the Museum of African Art, the Veda and Dr. Zdravko Petr collection, but that can also be applied to other forms uh, of representation and knowledge production. I already used it as an example uh, during uh, NAM talks uh, several weeks ago within the current exhibition at the Museum of African Art, the non-aligned world that Anna talked about yesterday. But now I would like to offer yet another step in its uh, analysis. The example is not just one object. Uh, it is a complex interaction of the humongous anchor, ship anchor at the museum entrance. Um, therefore, so basically draws the whole museum uh, into this picture. Uh, then the initial plaque um, next to the anchor with the inscription and recently curated information that adds to the initial explanation. Uh, I will show you here. No. Uh, the anchor belonged to a ship, a slave ship sunk in Guinea Bay. Uh, and Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr, the collectors of the main collection, were also active contributors to the anti colonial struggle which is a fact that cannot be emphasized enough as it was completely, completely obscured during 1990s and 2000s uh, until theorist Olivier Adouchi uh, within the project Non-Aligned Modernisms, which was initiated by Zora Neric, uh, chief curator at the Museum of uh, uh, Contemporary Art in Belgrade. Um, uh, Olivier reconstructed some of the events and brought back names to the people in the photographs. Let me show you that as well. Uh, from the Algerian War for Independence. Uh, photographs taken by Zdravko Petr and Abdelkader Laribi, or Nemanja Radonjic, who reconstructed more thoroughly the lives of, of Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr within the exhibition that em Emilia Epstein and I did in 2017 uh, under the title Nimpa Kornadzidzi, Reconceptualization of the Museum of African Art. Uh, it was an attempt uh, at translating uh, into practice the two said uh, discourses. 
Uh, so Veda Zagorac and Zdravko uh, Petr had this huge uh, object shipped uh, to Yugoslavia and from the time it was exhibited in 1977, which was the time of opening of the museum, it was accompanied by a plate uh, stating that uh, Yugos Yugoslav peoples never took part um, in the slave trade. The meaning of the anchor was to underline the difference of this museum in regard to the museums in the West that were built out of the, of the quote unquote colonial plunder. Uh, starting from the very obvious that it is problematic uh, to display an object that made part of uh, the inhumane subjugation and uh, death industry that was slave trade. And basically to use the tragedy of millions in order to show that we had nothing to do with it. Other immediate problems readable from this setup are Yugocentrism, interpreting not only the NAM solely from the Yugoslav perspective and interpreting the NAM uncritically in regard uh, to the Yugoslav role, but also seeing everything else, such as Africa or slavery through that same lens. Colonial and therefore racial exceptionalism understood as a complete denial of the necessity to position oneself within the transnational imperial knowledge production and therefore formations of race something that Catherine Baker writes about, expressed through the text on the very sign next to the anchor, and cultural appropriation. In this particular example, seen not in the appropriation of an artwork as can be seen at the museum display, but rather the appropriation of the narrative of, of, uh, of trauma uh, turned into victimhood. Now, the recent curatorial edition uh, that accompanied the current exhibition, uh, Non-Aligned World, here is the explanation, uh, was meant to link this object more explicitly uh, to non-alignment and anti-colonialism, something that was uh, self-explanatory at the time uh, of the Museum of African Art opening. It quotes Veda Zagorat's interpretation of the plague next to the anchor, reading as, uh, I'm quoting, since Yugoslavia never participated uh, in colonization of other peoples, it was possible for it to be one of the bearers of non-alignment. Now, as much as it is uh, really important in words of Emilia Epstein uh, to bring back Veda Zagorat's voice and Emilia is doing a groundbreaking work in this, in this sense, bringing her voice back that was, that was nearly erased, nearly completely erased in the meantime. It is also equally important uh, to analyze uh, such discourse, namely this kind of explanation that situates a certain perceived privilege in the past, the narrative that is uh, inscribed in all of the institutions of heritage, belonging to a model of establishing historical difference in regard to someone else, which is in the root of all the imperial hierarchies that anti-colonialism today should by all means deconstruct. In conclusion, my view is that uh, recuperating counter histories uh, may only seem as uh, one step on the way, just as the decolonization of representation that has not yet been done in either of the two museums is only a small part of the work that needs to be done in decolonization of knowledge production. I believe that we need to move beyond mere historization and include the more nuanced contextualization of the history that we recuperate, being aware of the urgencies of the present moment that have brought such topics forward in the first place. I can see, however, uh, this affective heritage serving its emancipatory role by pointing at the values that can now take off as a set of ideas, reshaping and redistributing within different modes of knowledge production. And I think that's it for today. Thank you. Anna, thanks so much for that brilliant and lucid invitation to a critical debate and dialogue. Because of the way you had your screen, I thought there was going to be five more slides and you were brilliant because you've kept well within the time. And I think what you also did was what reminded us what Sarah Salem said this morning about the unfinished project of decolonialization and the unfinished project of decolonizing museums. So. By my watch, we have at least 20 minutes. Perhaps if we run to the restaurant rather than walk, we have half an hour. But let's see how this goes. Um, I actually haven't managed to multitask and, and do it here. Um, are there any questions from Zoom 
or anyone in the chat? There's a comment. Do you want to bring, yeah, can you bring, I'm sorry, I, I was going to try and do it with this, but I can't, can't multitask. Oh, it's a long question. Oh, it's, there are many, que oh no, here we are. So it's from Boyan, yeah, sorry, uh, do join me. <laughs> um, okay, so Zoltan's already engaging with Bojana Videkanic. Um, very interesting conversation, Zoltan. It would be good to also mention the League of Anti-Communism, founded in the US, funded by US state and largely consisting of former fascists who escaped Europe. They were ultranationalists and fascists. Zoltan replies, sorry for the 23 minutes. I'd love to show more of the materials and a reference to the exhibition. So I think that's, that's not something that Zoltan need, needs to reply to, but we've got the chat here. I do encourage people to put, put, um, put a question in the chat or say they want to ask a question because I will give the Zoom room priority, okay? So now I turn to the room room and ask for questions and discussions. Liliana first, please. We seem to have two microphones. Do what you want. Yeah. It really is cafe talk. Is it just a, a kind of a, a question of photography? Um, I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember um, the, the um, conclusion of the discussions on the NAM satellite that would support exchange of information uh, between non-aligned uh, news agencies and telecasters. Uh, was it launched in 1975, or it was? A question for you. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I doubt. I didn't really focus on that, but uh, I didn't find any mention of it. So I, I doubt it was anything happened in the time I was uh, um, looking at. Um, so yeah, the question is, I, I don't really know, but. Uh, I haven't found any mention of it, so. I believe that that, that uh, meeting in just just a minute, that meeting in New Delhi in 1975, there was a kind of um, agreement uh, signed by the by the participant participating countries of launching the NAM satellite to assure the independence of uh, of the technology that was in hands of uh, either East or, or West. So, I mean, the, tech the technological aspects seem to me very important concerning the poverty and, and the really modest resources that could be, and technological um, resources also, that could be uh, involved in this agency. Sorry, it's just more, more, more like a comment than a question. Yeah, it's a, it's a relevant question, yeah, but as I said, I was focusing on the other thing. I didn't really notice it, but I'm still going through the, the materials. Um, but I haven't really noticed that, that it it went through. Thank you. Yeah, and it's a fast. I mean, you can pass the baton to, to Sanya behind for the next question. But before that, I mean, I think it was the Algiers conference in 1973 where the technology broke down. And I think, and, and one of the Algerian delegates said, look how reliant we are on Western technology. So I think it's, a, it's an incredibly important question. It also takes the temporal spatial into outer space for our project, which, which is good. But, uh, the next question is Sanya. Uh, okay, first of all, I want to thank to all the three presenters. It was very interesting, and uh, I think it broadened the complexi complexity of, uh, of this seminar. Uh, and um, I have a question for uh, Anna Sladojevic. Um, thank you for your excellent uh, presentation, and in general, thank you for your contribution in the field. Uh, I think it's very, very important. Uh, and um, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate more on uh, on the notion of authenticity uh, in relation to the um, um, building up of the collection. And I think Emilia Epstein recently published a work uh, on uh, the role of that uh, notion uh, in uh, making the difference between colonial and anti-colonial museum. And how would you uh, relate that uh, notion to the object that you focused uh, your attention on in this presentation, the, an the anchor, um, and uh, also maybe if you could um, 
if you could tell us, um, so that would be another question, uh, if you could tell us your thoughts on um, mm, contemporary art interventions that also took place in the museum and um, if that could be a way uh, of decolonizing the museum in your, from your perspective. Uh, thank you, thank you for the, mm -hmm. do, you, do you hear me? Okay, I will just do this. Uh, yes, about the authenticity. Uh, authenticity in my mind is the relation between an object and the context. So everything can be authentic in some context. So we need to link uh, a particular object to context in order to make it authentic. However, authenticity is a very notorious uh, term within the field of African art representation because it has been construed through the imperial paradigm that I was talking about. So one has to be very careful about this. Um, I will link that to, to your question about contemporary artists because the Museum of African Art has a long uh, history of collaborating with uh, contemporary artists. And actually uh, the breakthrough in my research and for my PhD was collaboration with Barthelemy Tago in 2006, uh, who uh, his contemporary artist uh, working between Cameroon and uh, Paris and Berlin. And uh, he actually made the first comment uh, with his work named uh, Omar Stuzravko Petr, but in a way um, asking whether a collector, uh, nevertheless, if it is a collector uh, from the communist or socialist milieu is still a collector. And um, he pointed out that this kind of extractivist, uh, extractivist um, uh, approach of every kind of collecting uh, to, uh, let's say, the, the, the topic of the collecting. So yes, contemporary art definitely can be um, let's say uh, a way justice theory is of uh, commenting upon museums and museum practice but at the same time um, uh, my view is that we have three steps in um, let's say uh, working with museums one is recognition that something is wrong uh, and this recognition was Bartelemy Togo's work and also Dan Sretenovic's work in, in 2004. The second step is historization. This is something Emilia Epstein and I did uh, in uh, the exhibition in Pakornadzice. And the third step would be emancipation. Now, this is what I'm striving for. And this is because I have been invited to lead the project uh, with anti-colonialism in mind at the Museum uh, of African Art at this moment which would actually embrace this third step, which would be emancipation of the discourse. And this is what we need. And it would be more kind of dialogical and discursive than object-based. Super, okay. That, this, this discussion could run and run. Do we have any more questions? Yes, please. Hi, uh, thank Lubitsa. you. Thank you, uh, Sasha. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the new world information and communication order, but especially since you come from Slovenia, it's a bit of a selfish question as well, whether because Bogdan Osolnik right, was the man, member of the McBride Commission, if you can elaborate a bit on that, but also tell us whether there is a separate archive uh, uh, around his role and engagement in this kind of more international global discussions at UNESCO, as you mentioned. So the role of Osolnik and uh, the McBride Commission. Thank you. Uh, yes, well, th thank you for the, the question. Well, regarding his archive, I hope there is. Some people have told me that he, he was really meticulous about it. I'm in contact with his family, but they're really reluctant to tell me anything or, or uh, to let me see anything. So uh, hopefully, uh, uh, I will manage to, to, to get something. I did do an interview uh, with him shortly be before it, he passed away, so it's published in the journal Triple C, uh, which is an open access journal, so you, uh, if you Google Osolnik and my name and Triple C, you can uh, find it about his role uh, in the McBride um, Commission. Um, so his role was, well, even before that, Integro, he was the, the secretary for information uh, and under his watch, the first law on, on new, uh, news media was, or mass media was passed in Yugoslavia, I think it was 62, something like that. Um, he was coordinating the non-aligned um, delegations within UNESCO. That started, I think, in 76, at the initiative of Yugoslavia, the non-aligned movement started coordinating uh, before uh, uh, UNESCO summits. and. Uh, that was also the point where um, 
UNESCO uh, started first with the mass media declaration where Ostolnik also played an, a significant role by coordinating the non-aligned uh, delegations and later by uh, uh, the McBride Commission, which of course, um, after it presented you know, its final report in, in Belgrade in 1980, the thing you know, kind of ran into, the conf into conflict with um, the, we the West. So it kind of followed the same trajectory at, at, as the economic talks, because UNCTAD had gr already ground to a halt by the, the 80s. Um, you know, communication came a bit, bit later, and also ended a bit later because uh, the United States left UNESCO out of protest in '84 um, because of basically not only the work of the McBride Commission, but this new world uh, information and communication order, and took a third of the budget with them. Um, and even today, I was uh, uh, at a UNESCO conference. Um, a couple of years ago, I mentioned I was talking about McBride, and I was immediately reprimanded, you know, by someone from the uh, UNESCO uh, secretariat in a very diplomatic way. You know, they have a great way of saying, you know, <laughs> perhaps you know, if you want your ideas, you know, to be accepted, you should not mention <laughs> McBride. It's not a good thing. <laughs> so they're still very much traumatized. Um, so yeah, here uh, the role of uh, Ostolnik was very important, both within Yugoslavia and. Uh, in the non-aligned movement, together with um, Mustafa Masmoudi, who was uh, from 84 to 88, I believe, the Minister for Information of Tunisia. Uh, and at this time, Tunisia was the coordinator of the Intergovernmental uh, Council for Information of the Non-Aligned Movement. Uh, and there was very close you know, uh, collaboration between Yugoslavia and Tunisia at, uh, at um, this time. And Masmoudi was also later the member, together with Osornik, of the McBride um, Commission. Um, so I, ho I hope it's a very, it's, you know, it's a very broad <laughs> question, so I hope I answered it at least partially. Is it, a f is it direct follow-on? No. Yeah. Uh, we'll Go ahead. I'm sorry, but uh, I just wanted to follow up on what uh, Anna uh, replied, uh, Anna Sladovic. Uh, it occurred to me that it may not be clear. By the way, I'm Sanja Horvatinčić. I don't know if she <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I didn't say who I am, and I understand that they cannot see us well. Um, so uh, I was just wondering. Um, uh, I wanted to elaborate more on the question about authenticity. Uh, I was. Uh, my question comes from the. Um, the fact that heritage in Yugoslavia was very much understood in those terms when we look at the way that collections from the people's liberation struggle were, were um, uh, made, uh, they were very much focused on uh, the idea of authenticity of authentic locations and authentic objects from the revolution. And I was wondering maybe if you or maybe Anna Knezhevich, who is also here from the museum, uh, could answer the question whether there was any attempt from the Museum of African Art to think of the like contemporary events, the revolutions and liberation struggles in Africa uh, to be musealized in the way that people's liberation struggle was musealized uh, in that very same period. So yeah, this is my interest in how authenticity was understood uh, maybe in differently uh, when it comes to uh, Yugoslav own heritage of revolution and uh, African context. Super, uh, which Anna, me, you, yeah, go, yes. go ahead Anna. Yes, I will, I will just answer shortly. Uh, when, you, when you say authenticity, in, in the case of the Museum of African Art, everything was about the authenticity of the collection. So Veda Zagorac and Zdravko Petr collected the uh, whole collection by the book, relying on the literature of the time, uh, catalogs of the great museum, etc., etc., etc. So embracing the canon of authenticity of African art. They were partially aware, I think, that uh, their lives and their own anti-colonial struggle will be of interest. And this is what you are finding in the, uh, let's say, archive, informal archive, their own documentation at the Museum of African Art, because they bequeathed this as well as everything else to the museum. Uh, 
However, uh, I, I, would, I would actually say that they were not aware of, at the time uh, of the necessity to musealize certain things because they were part of the discourse. Uh, in particular, what I was talking about, and the sentiment of anti-colonialism and non-alignment, it was inscribed in the dominant discourse of the time. So there was no need to emphasize it in particular through museum representation. I hope this clears out. If if you were here, we would we would be doing a long conversation over lunch for, for sure, and that's one of the problems of Zoom. Zoltan, I have a question for you. I mean, this was a great presentation of three episodes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. This was a great presentation of three episodes. Forgive me. I want to I want to pick on the second one through a Eugocentric lens, because it was very much about the role of India in 1956 after the Hungarian Revolution in mediating and attempting to lessen the kind of punishments for the leaders. Uh, Yugoslavia was embroiled in 1956 in very many complicated ways, but one of them became that actually Yugoslav leadership was also trying to do the same thing. So it's a very simple question really from your uh, reading of the archives. Was there um, collaboration between the Indian leadership and the Yugoslav leadership around this? Okay, thank you. I didn't actually concentrate on that. So the this the second episode is a kind of a new part of my research. So the first and the third is very much developed. So I don't know for sure. I'm not the one to actually answer uh, uh, that. I, I didn't have the resources to look that up in the archives connected to Hungary. But uh, in terms of India, it was a really interesting moment, I think, because this was a moment when India really tried to, uh, or there, at least there, there were these diplomats including Menon, uh, really tried to think about opening up to the Eastern Bloc and gain some sort of uh, um, influence in the region, which was a new thing at that time. Uh, and what I really find interesting is that this memory politics that I tried to refer to is that India somehow also as an anti-colonial, uh, you know, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, history uh, remained strong in Hungary, not just because of the activity of the Indologists that I referred to, Hungarian Indologists and Orientalists, which uh, their heritage has been importantly uh, processed in Hungary, but also because of these various relations that I tried to show. The relationship to the 1956 revolution uh, achieved that they remained in the national memory politics and this kind of India. So you can easily talk about Indian anti-colonialism, whereas because of the anti-communist narratives very strong after 1989, you cannot really talk about, uh, we talk about street names previously, and there is no Lumumba street anymore in Budapest because they renamed it in 1991, but there is Nehru Coast in Budapest because that remained part of our, you know, uh, uh, our, um, our memory of, of having a positive relation to India. So I think we should also talk about this memory politics, but just a short last comment. Uh, it's natural that we talk a lot about Yugoslavia when we talk about non-aligned movements and non-alignedness, but I find it very, a, a bit problematic when we're not reflecting, I think, enough on the lack of research on the other countries also had some sort of relationship with or to non-aligned movements. Think of Hungary, Hungary, which is, I found it really largely under-researched, but we could talk about other countries. So I'd be open to think of, you know, more comparative uh, connections and discussions. Oh, sorry, the messages that Zoltan has replied to Bojana. Zoltan, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are two things to say to you. There's not even enough work on the other countries who were member states of the non-aligned movement. Uh, so before we think about even the secondary thing, but the other thing is, of course, this shouldn't be about nation states. It should be about connections and nodes and, and uh, networks and so on. Um, Will you hold this for me for a second while I multitask? Of course. Just a second. 
see one new message, but I can't tell whether it is a new message. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, Anna is replying to you, Sanya. Thank you, Sanya, for the questions. Of course I recognized you, lol. I hope this isn't private. I hope, uh, sorry for not greeting everyone at the beginning as I rush to meet them presentation time. That's my dreadful chairing. I'm sorry for not being there in person next time. It, it was the next best thing, but Anna, you, you, unless you can get here quickly, you won't be able to join us for lunch. Uh, but I really want to thank the three presenters, Sasha, uh, Zoltan, and Anna. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, and we will start again. I see Boyan uh, is already with us. Uh, I hope you're having breakfast. Um, we will we will we will recommence at 15:30 Central European time. Thanks very much.
Ya da. Yalan.
Yalan. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you back to the afternoon session of our second day. Uh, I hope you had a nice break, and um, uh, I, I'm honored to welcome you in this interesting session, uh, which is entitled uh, Anti-Colonial and Socialist Aesthetics and Discourses. Uh, we're in for a treat with uh, different points of view on emancipatory potential of artistic and cultural production with our three uh, speakers, uh, Grega Ulen, Bojana Videkanic and Natasha Kovacevic. As Paul, I would also like to urge uh, each and every one of you uh, joining us here in Rijeka, but also on Zoom to ask questions after we hear the, th the three presentations. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna start by introducing Grega Ulen. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Com Comparative Literature at Princeton University. He works on 20th century cultural production from Africa, the Caribbean, the Middle East, and the Balkans, focusing on the questions of decolonization, utopianism, third worldism, non-alignment, and the relationship between politics and aesthetics. He is also interested in the histories of Eurocentrism, Orientalism, and method methodological nationalism, and the disciplinary production of knowledge. He's gonna talk to, us, uh, talk to us about aesthetics of decolonization and non-aligned comparatism. Grega. Hi. Um, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to start off by saying how happy I am to be a part of this conference and this panel in particular. And also a little sad that I can't be there with you in person, but uh, thanks to Paul and Liliana for uh, putting all of this together. And I'll just start by reading out some of the parts of the definition of the non-aligned movement proposed by the conference organizers, which describes non-alignment as a set of practices connected with broader networks of cultural and political solidarity and contributing to a common political agenda of decolonization, as well as challenging the supposed universality of colonial modernity and questioning capitalist concepts of development. And I understand this conference in part as filling in some of the historiographic gaps in the study of um, so-called actually existing decolonization that were created by post-colonial studies. 
Uh, David Scott summarizes the historicist narrative most generously when he writes about two moments. First, the moment of anti-coloniality in the 1940s and 50s, whose problem space was defined by social, economic, and political decolonization, and found expression in the demand for self-representation, that is, restoring an authentic relationship between representation and reality. But according to Scott, only the moment of post-coloniality that arose in the late 1970s and 80s, most notably with Edward Said, problematized the relationship between colonialism and knowledge and posed the question of decolonization of representation itself. Now, first of all, this account is bookmarked by, bookended by what Samir Amin has called the Bandung Project. So the promise of a new world order and its tragic end, which then coincides with the institutionalization of post-colonial criticism in the Anglo-American Academy. The symptomatic gap between these two moments is in the shape of the non-aligned movement, which as many of you know, operated within a different political logic than the first wave of decolonization did. Um, but more importantly, I think post-colonial narratives of history identify decolonization with so-called national independence and situate the nation state as a precondition for reclaiming abstract freedom, which only in the second stage then enables questioning colonial knowledge and naive metaphysics of national presence. But I want to suggest that this is a misreading of the actual utopian rupture of decolonization, or at least a very narrow view of it, since in fact, other anti-colonialisms existed, not all national in form, and despite Franz Fanon's critique, no more assimilationist than the nationalist models of French Algeria or British India. And I'm interested in those cultural forms and aesthetic practices that have eschewed the nation form and really aim to displace enlightenment humanism and its secular liberal definition of the human. The same kind of methodological nationalism that has uh, hyper canonized Fanon's brand of national liberationism um, has also cemented very binary models of the colonizer versus the colonized in post-colonial studies and critical paradigms like writing back to the empire or Manichaean aesthetics, which ironically end up recentering the metropole at the expense of other, let's say, horizontal connections. And they also ignore the determining context of the Cold War, which I think non-alignment brings back into view. And I'll share my PowerPoint so you have other images to look at as well. Um, and I think this conjunctural view of non-alignment that we're theorizing here allows us to decouple it from its historical institutional manifestations, but also to think about non-alignment as method. So not just an object of knowledge, but also a conceptual reorientation of spaces and subjects and archives, something I'm calling non-aligned comparatism that offers other kinds and modes of comparison. One such transnational form of organization and identification was the cultural conference. And I wanna talk about the first Congress of Black Writers and Artists that took place between the 19th and the 22nd of September, 1956 in Paris. So in addition to marking the 60th anniversary of the Belgrade Summit, we're in the midst of the 65th anniversary of the Paris Congress. Invited delegates from all over the world gathered to discuss questions of culture and aesthetics pertaining to an imagined community called the Black World and its anti-colonial struggles. It was conveyed by Alioune Diop, founder of the journal Présence Africaine, this one here in the middle, who characterized the Congress as a cultural bandung. He underscored that men of culture had played 
as profound a role in colonialism as men of politics did. And I quote him here, colonization would have been reduced to a few simple short-lived episodes had culture not come to bring its lasting support to the work and the designs of the soldier, the colonist, the politician. It is truly responsible for what is called the colonial situation. Now this positively Saidian insight only reached the Metropolitan Academies in the 1980s, but critics from the peripheries had long been aware of the relationship between representation and power, especially colonial power. For Diop, this imbrication of culture with colonization allowed for a reverse or reparative project of cultural decolonization, whereby politicized art, committed art, could not only expose imperialist and racist exploitation by contesting colonial imaginaries, it would also supplant Eurocentric provincialism with more expansive humanist visions. Poet, politician, and philosopher Leopold Sédar Songo presented a paper from his signature Negritude stance. He rejected the criticism he had attracted for supposedly suggesting that Africans have emotion like Europeans have reason, and instead argued that Black reason is, quote, another way of knowing, that it offers an alternative to the hegemonic Enlightenment rationality. White reason, according to him, is analytical, instrumental. It impoverishes the vitalism of the world by dividing it into constitutive parts, abstracting it, calculating, while Black reason is intuitive, sympathetic, participatory. It's about concrete ways of seeing and thinking that transcend the subject-object division and the pretense to objective knowledge. It's about the place of body and affect in cognition. It's about the importance of rhythm, one of Senghor's key concepts. This intuitive rationality isn't irrational or precognitive. It's simply a non-analytical approach to reality, a form of understanding that's relational, perceptual, and non-conceptual. Senghor might have insisted that black and white corresponded to real life subjects, most frequently Africans and Europeans, but they were also heuristic devices that made visible different modes of knowing and being ultimately accessible to everybody. Suleiman Bashir Diagne has suggested very helpfully that we read Senghor's racial difference through the prism of strategic essentialism, which nonetheless destabilizes fixed identities. And that he always tried to remind us of, <clears throat> excuse me, the promise of a more complete humanity. And despite going on about Black ontology and the laws of Black African culture that extend even to the diaspora, he also started his essay with an expanded concept of people of color, for whom Bandung represents a spirit of liberation from both political blocs, and ended it with the vision of an indivisible mankind a universality that's mediated by blackness, but which displaces the racial matrix of identity. And importantly, through aesthetic knowledge. When Senghor declared at the Congress that cultural liberation was a necessary condition for political liberation, he seemed outdated to the anti-colonial nationalists, but he foresaw that a change in state power cannot in and of itself eliminate alienation or the social relations of production rooted in colonial modernity. Sangor believed that art offered the possibility for that kind of transformative change, especially African art, which he claimed wasn't mimetic or referential. And here's a quote from his essay from a year earlier. The art object by its very reality creates a new world, that of tomorrow. That is how a new Africa is being created in the hearts and minds of our writers who, because rooted in the reality of the present, already project its branches full of sap into the air of the future. 
and this world will no longer be entirely African, and neither will it be only Europe. It will be a hybrid world. <clears throat> and the word he uses is Métis from Métissage. Even though he draws on many examples from so-called traditional Africa, in which he saw an organic unity of knowledge, artistic technique, and collective ritual, Sangor's nostalgic return to origins was part of a dialectical process where the affirmed past needs to be transcended by a new future-oriented humanism. For him, decolonization wasn't just home rule, but neither was it a homecoming or a restoration of some lost purity as critics tend to interpret his nicketude. Instead, it was the construction of a radically different interdependent and interpenetrating utopian future, which was simultaneously made possible and foreclosed by existing imperialism and international capitalism. And just as a digression here, but I'd be happy to talk more about it in Q&A. Senghor's philosophical and aesthetic project also had a political equivalent in his longtime campaign for federalism as an alternative to nationalism. And by the way, his theory of federation was modeled in part on socialist Yugoslavia. At the same Congress, the harshest critic of global blackness was Jacques Stéphane Alexis, a Haitian writer, doctor, and communist revolutionary who helped overthrow his first Comprador president at the age of 23 and was brutally murdered around his 39th birthday while attempting to topple the Duvalier dictatorship. Alexis blasted Senghor for his racial essentialism and for romanticizing pre-colonial African culture and resituated the distinction between intuitive and analytical rationality in historical materialist terms. All peoples everywhere are endowed with both reason and feeling. Alexis said, but the unequal division of labor affects the extent to which they use their bodily senses, which industrial civilization impedes um, and it alienates in the Marxist sense of the word. In contrast, quote, the underdeveloped populations of the world, having still recently lived closer to nature, have for centuries been forced particularly to sharpen their eyes, their hearing, their touch. End quote. So people living under the conditions of uneven and combined development know a mixture of mechanical civilization and natural life and continue to have a sensibility for a special liveliness. And this shows in their art, which hadn't undergone the rigorous specialization, separation from daily life and commodification like it has in advanced capitalist societies where people have become estranged from the experience of beauty in everyday life. And it's that spiritual alienation under capitalism that's an objective limitation to powerful art. Of course, underdevelopment shouldn't just be fetishized, but neither can poverty, starvation, and unemployment be fixed through capitalist development and incorporation into the unequal world system. Capitalism negates culture, Alexi thought. And so combined and uneven development of the peripheries actually provides a curious temporary advantage because as he would write a year later, the writers and artists of underdeveloped countries benefit and will continue to benefit from the fact that the popular creation of new artistic forms is an ongoing and continuous process. And um, Alexi had a somewhat Maoist idea of the peasant masses as not only the politically progressive class, but also a kind of unalienated source of cultural creativity. So Alexi historicized what Sangor called another way of knowing with reference to material conditions and not race. He likewise believed that not only can art and life not be separated, that the material order doesn't simply um, mechanically pre-exist the social and aesthetic dimensions, 
but that only a more dialectical conception of culture can advance the struggle for decolonization and a new humanism, which he said was as much of uh, the West as it was of Asia. It was a more universal humanism, which will create the possibility, and I quote again the last part that you see on the screen, to make use of an entire aspect of the human that has been neglected, underestimated, and has seriously atrophied in the old cultures of the West. And uh, Sylvia Winter has done absolutely brilliant work on this, but she's drawn mostly on Fanon and Aimé Césaire, and I wanted to talk about others who made similar moves. So decolonization, rather than simply nationalizing state sovereignty, creates an opening for cultural and existential healing of the imperialist metropoles and peripheries alike. The promise of an unenclosed global utopian future. Now, I don't have time to develop it here, but Alexei was convinced that the right aesthetic and representational mode was realism, though a different kind of realism than the ones that emerged from the Enlightenment tradition and its secularist and rationalist forms of knowledge. In fact, third worldist artists from across the globe overwhelmingly professed an idea of social and aesthetic commitment, which they articulated as a form of literary realism. Not analytical, but fighting living realism, as Alexi put it, which produces both knowledge and action. The last writer fighter I want to discuss in this theoretical field is Miroslav Krleža and his address to another Congress of the Yugoslav Writers Union in 1952, four years before the Paris Congress. Many of you are familiar with his opening speech. Uh, in fact, Boyana, who's speaking after me, discusses it in her book. Um, and it calls for a vernacular literature of social commitment as a third space outside the false choice between Western European aestheticism and Soviet socialist realism. Karleza also put aesthetics at the heart of a political project when he declared that literature was a precondition for the formation of a revolutionary socialist consciousness and that imitating the artistic models or political for that matter that were developed in the two blocks was out of the question because those historically contingent methods of representation were conceived for aesthetically working out specific social situations and will fail to account for the unique nature of the current conjuncture in peripheral Yugoslavia. Against both Cold War superpowers wanting to reconstruct the country's subcolonial condition, and those are his words, Karleja prefigured the coming of a third worldist project and of Yugoslavia's orientation towards non-alignment, in solidarity with the world's dispossessed. Quote, since we belong to the category of those civilizations that could not develop because foreign forces violated their right to moral and material survival. The crux of the matter was finding the most appropriate way of describing the real beyond just the visual. But the problem of representation is bound up with the epistemological problem of knowing and understanding reality. <clears throat> excuse me, which committed art is tasked with doing and not by simply reflecting that which is supposed to be objectively real. It also needs to include dynamic liveliness, which is Alexei's keyword, and rhythm, uh, which is Senghor's catchphrase. And I think Karleza um, was also thinking about different ways of knowing, much like Senghor. All these three theorists that I've discussed were um, declared Marxists, but they radically rethought the kind of mechanistic reflectionist model of base and superstructure that was enforced by the Soviet state ideologues. Um, Karleza spoke of moral intellectual meteorolo meteorology um, and used other ecosystemic metaphors to describe Yugoslav reality as 
um, a kind of um, uh, uh, full of fossils in fermentation that required thinking beyond the narrowly defined human subject. Uh, I'll stop sharing here. Um, and what's remarkable is that four years later, Alexi would use uncannily similar language. Um, and I'm going to skip this because I'm already running out of time. But um, in his own theory of uh, amalgamation of historical residue, colonialism wasn't purely repressive or destructive as it was for Césaire and Fanon, but was instead productive of new ways of, new forms of Creole life. In contrast to nationalist notions of common descent and historical continuity, for Alexi, Haitian culture was a fusion of pre-colonial and colonial sediments, uh, as well as uh, post-colonial struggles that continue to shape it. And if being is syncretism, then whatever decolonization might look like, it couldn't mean recovering some form of authenticity that uh, precedes the rupture of colonization. It could only mean revalorizing the residual as the emergent uh, and imagining building better and freer futures. And today we inhabit the ruins of those alternative futures uh, imagined by thinkers who didn't think together, but I believe we have much to learn from thinking them together under the heading of non-alignment, which uh, as a political project uh, or ideology was based on orientation rather than identity and so offers us uh, alternatives to the kinds of national, continental, racial, or ethnic modes of uh, comparative cultural critique. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Grega, for your interesting talk. Uh, I think it plays really well into what we've been di discussing the past few days, especially uh, the suggestion of non-alignment as method, which we have been really discussing today, like uh, keeping in mind that we have to do a multi-nodal uh, multi analysis, uh, think about the connections, uh, etc. I'm sure there will be questions as we have historians of culture in the room. Uh, but uh, first, uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Boana Videkanic. Uh, she is an associate professor of contemporary art and visual culture in the Department of Fine Arts at the University of Waterloo. Her research focuses on the 20th century socialist art in Yugoslavia and its contributions to the rise of global modernisms, socialist art, and anti-imperialist cultural work in the 20th century. Uh, you probably all know about her book, Non-Aligned Modernism, Socialist Postcolonial Aesthetics in Yugoslavia from 1945 to 1985, which came out uh, last year. Uh, Boena's uh, lecture is, is, is titled Socialism, People's Art, and the Non-Aligned. Boena, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just going to try to share my screen because I do have a uh, PowerPoint. Um, just bear with me until I am able to do that. Um, and if someone can tell me if you can see the full screen of my presentation. Now we see it. It's, it's okay. great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, it's morning here in Canada, so I'm a little bit time uh, confused, but uh, good afternoon to you and good afternoon, good morning to those who are on this side of the Atlantic. Um, and uh, I would like to thank Liliana, Sanya, and Paul, and others, of course, who are part of this research project for organizing the conference and for um, working hard on um, creating this hybrid space. Um, it has been a real pleasure to share the real and uh, digital space with everybody and to think about um, the non-aligned. Um, I'm going to um, uh, sort of present a couple of things and some images. Um, I think Grega's presentation was perfect because it really provides like uh, amazing context to 
some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. So Grega, thank you so much for doing that uh, um, uh, excellent, excellent um, work. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really happy to, to listen to, your, uh, to, to what you're doing and what you're researching. Um, so the, the work that I'm presenting right now um, is part of uh, the beginning uh, of, or the beginning of a project that uh, I've just started this summer. I was able to do some research um, in Croatia, but really only starting to think about these ideas um, as of this year. So um, what you're going to be uh, listening to is uh, a kind of a um, uh, a germ of something that will develop over the next year or so. Um, I'm going to try to present certain fragments of what I'm working on, and hopefully that will make sense, and I can, you know, contextualize it a bit more um, in the um, in the uh, Q and A. So the title of my presentation is Socialism, People's Art, and the Non-Aligned, and I'm trying to sort of uh, contextualize the non-aligned in a broader context, uh, a longer historical context, um, and in kind of a longer 20th century uh, um, trajectory. Um, but essentially, my, my work, uh, at, as of this point, sort of builds on what I've been working on earlier for my book, uh, but it deepens it, and it deepens it because I'm thinking about Miroslav Krleža, and in fact, his work has sort of prompted me to start thinking about these, uh, these ideas. So Yugoslav art during the socialist period was an eclectic terrain, open to many different modes of art making, from various realist and modernist tendencies, neo-avant-garde of the mid-1960s to forms of quote-unquote naive art or outsider art or amateur art. Um, this artistic eclecticism was reflective of the ways in which the state itself experimented with different approaches to socialist economy and politics, um, non-aligned being one big uh, part of that, trying to find the right balance between socialism and pressures of the Cold War, and of course, internal uh, external pressures of capitalism. Um, Yugoslavia's founding of and participation in the non-aligned movement was also reflective of the state's search for a way out of the bind of the dividing, uh, divided world, of course. Um, and even though non-alignment was the first uh, a political and economic movement, it nevertheless, as Grega so well pointed out, um, over time uh, became, and I think always was the cultural movement as well, because of the importance of what we've talked about earlier this morning, um, uh, uh, of the 20th century sort of um, anti-imperialist and anti-colonial projects always understood the importance of culture. So the, the culture of the non-aligned was produced many different, on many different levels, official and unofficial, and with various artistic forms uh, that responded to it in different ways. Um, so in this very short presentation, I would like to briefly connect the long tradition of Yugoslav engaged art done by non-academically trained artists. Um, and I'm making this, and, and this is because I'm still trying to find the right word or right way to call these artists. Um, so basically artists who were not trained prof in professional art schools, uh, tradition that goes uh, back well before World War II in Yugoslavia. Um, and I also look at the politically engaged art uh, done by professional artists uh, that thematized struggle against fascist occupation in Yugoslavia dur during the World War II. So really the project looks at this kind of engaged realism or lively realism or political uh, realism and non-realism and modernism done by a variety of different artists. Um, these forms of art, uh, meaning uh, from academically and non-academically trained artists, uh, although divergent in some respect, in many others are connected. And not only because many of these artists were actually presented uh, together in exhibitions in, in non-aligned world internationally during socialist Yugoslavia. Um, my interest in, in particular is particularly focused on the ways in which art and political struggle intersected during socialism and how forms of art making that sought to break the hierarchies of art artistic production institutional structures coexisted with more traditional um, art practices. These intersecting lines meet most obviously during the war, meaning World War II, but also World War I, 
uh, and they continue in the post-war period in Yugoslavia's search for artistic and cultural production under new conditions of socialism. So I keep emphasizing this materialist dialectical role of art in building of socialism that is absolutely essential to how um, we can understand, read both Yugoslavia's uh, relationship to the non-aligned and also its own uh, culture. So my current research is focused on the so-called naive artists, and I'm 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 putting this in you know in in uh, brackets because I uh, the term has been used and thematized and theorized, uh, but I would like to avoid it and find something else to call uh, this kind of art. Uh, and I'm looking at artists who um, were politically engaged both before World War II, during World War I, uh, in interwar period, during World War II and after. So people like, for example, um, Miroslav Krleža, Marian Detoni, uh, Krsto Hegedušić, uh, even uh, Generalić and, uh, and uh, uh, Franja Mraz. Um, and they continue to do so and to do in this kind of mode after the war. Uh, World War II. So the term naive art is problematic, it's unstable, so I'll try to stay away from using it. Um, what is sometimes seen as naive art belongs to myriad different of uh, different genres and forms of making, all of which have different names. Similarly, what is considered uh, political art is very wide and varied, um, and in order to address this, uh, the particularity of Yugoslav forms of this art, but also to connect these forms to non-alignment, I wish to think about these forms of art, uh, uh, of these forms as seeking to overthrow standardized formal, conceptual, historical, and theoretical ways of understanding production um, and aesthetic, uh, and aesthetic uh, means. Um, and I'm interested in particular uh, how these forms of art, especially the so-called naive art, relate to artistic institutional character, it, the, the hierarchical nature of art, artistic production and um, the question who is called an artist, who has the right to make art, uh, exhibit art um, and, and be considered part of this. Um, and I think this is related to the non-aligned because it is really an incursion of the periphery into the center. Uh, politically, what we see with the non-aligned and, and anti-colonial, anti-imperialist movements, the political, but also aesthetic form. And here I'm kind of paralleling this to the naive artists or non-academically uh, trained artists uh, critiquing and incur incurring, incursing on or coming into the space of the so-called hierarchical elite art. Um, in all of this, I'm interested and in continuously bring forth the material view of this kind of art and it's the right dialectical role in, so, in building socialism and revolutionary politics. So my presentation will highlight just a few preliminary thoughts that I'm in the process of formulating as these relate to Yugoslav socialism, non-aligned and alternative forms of understanding artistic and cultural structures. Um, in order to formulate a relatively coherent presentation, I will just point out a few things in a kind of point form. Um, and um, right now my research is focusing on the work of uh, Franja Mraz, who's, uh, who's one of his paintings you see here called The Crossing on the Railway Tracks. He was a really interesting artist who crossed the boundary between naive and so-called professional art and in many ways paid a steep price for that uh, because he was rejected kind of by both. Um, but I'm really interested in his political commitment to the kind of work that he was doing. And he kind of stands as a, as a figure, as an interesting figure in all of this uh, discussion. Um, let me just move to the next slide. So you, number one, Yugoslav popular uh, or people's art. So for example, in Cuba, naive art is often referred to as people's art. Um, I'm using the popular people's art uh, term. Um, artists emerge, so Yugoslav uh, artists emerge in the midst of the potent tension-filled interwar cultural and political context. Um, which fermented new political movements based in worker and peasant uh, movements, formation of socialist, communist, revolutionary and political front in Yugoslavia, growing anti-imperialism and the realization that Yugoslav territories were at the mercy and in the clutches of great imperial powers. So this early 20th century. Um, Franjo Mraz was definitely part of this move as a peasant 
um, artist who emerged from the early 20th century. Um, he, he was very active before in the interwar period. Um, and, and a lot of this is reflected in his work. Um, number two, people's art and politically engaged art of the interwar uh, period intersected. Um, artists who were professionally trained and peasant and worker artists uh, collaborated, as we all know, through the, uh, through the work of uh, the collective Zemia and presented similar political and social concerns. However, there was always an equal power relationship, of course, between the non-academically trained peasant artists and those deemed professional artists. And this imbalance remained throughout the 20th century. Um, we see similar echoes of this in other um, places where similar uh, ideas about indigen indigenous art, uh, local art. I mean, I mentioned Cuba, where that has a very lively, quote unquote, naive art scene, um, but similar imbalances of power were existing. Number three, people's art in Yugoslavia um, was, um, was uh, after World War II, was very much uh, embedded in the new and growing worker and peasant culture, as well as amateur and in, uh, amateur culture, and in general, wish by the state to create a more democratic way of making culture outside of bourgeois elite sphere um, and as a domain of all. Um, and this all comes out of the emergent socialist understanding of culture and investment in culture. Um, socialist Yugoslavia's emphasis on mass education, mass culture, amateur and popular forms of cultural making, uh, forming of cultural institutions across the country. Um, these were all reflected in growing uh, growth and support of people's art, which very soon after World War II became a staple of mainstream art. So there's really interesting um, research emerging from Anna Hoffman um, and Tanya Petrovich, who are working on similar themes. Um, the fact reflected in the opening of various museums and galleries that supported, for example, naive art um, is also important. However, uh, throughout this all, the hierarchy of art remained in some form or an, of another. And my colleague Katya Praznik does a very good job of critiquing and sort of dissecting this. Um, number four, people's art in Yugoslavia reflected both the socialist revolutionary spirit and the ensuing transformation of culture into a socialist self-managed and ultimately non-aligned culture. Of course, there were problems with the ways that this form of art developed and in the so-called and the so-called naive artists themselves were very vocal in their critiques of institutionalization of their art. And some like Pranya Mraz, whose work you see here, uh, largely withdrew from the world of the naive art all, uh, uh, altogether or art in general. Um, Mraz, in fact, was also shunned uh, because of his uh, political and aesthetic views and struggles. Nonetheless, I am interested um, in the political and revolutionary potential that this kind of art represented as it existed during the interwar period, during World War II and during socialism, because socialist political context offered such an artistic production, both a context and infrastructure, national and international through the non-aligned networks that we've been all talking about. Number five, themes, theories, forms of making and conceptual underpinnings, um, um, uh, conceptual, um, um, underpinnings of people's art in Yugoslavia speak to the non-aligned political form through people's art seeking of alternative forms of art making. Its emphasis on non-hierarchical views of making of art and on art for the masses opposed to the elite. The mixing of the so-called high art and people's art or indigenous local art production uh, was something that non-aligned cultural workers across the non-aligned non world contemplating in seeking to provide alternatives to particular Western forms of cultural production. production. Indigeneity, local traditions and cultural specific specificities, local languages, oral traditions, etc., were all concerned uh, concerns encountered in most non-aligned countries as a way of building national cultures, were, which were decimated during the colonial imperial uh, period. And Grega has so eloquently talked about this. Um, an example of this for uh, uh, is um, a work by several prominent Nigerian um, art. An example of this is also um, Ben Nvovu, who is a Nigerian painter, who wrote this text in 1961. 
uh, who wrote uh, uh, the text in 1961 called The African View of Art and Some Problems Facing the African Artist, in which he, he um, talks about and struggles with this relationship between the periphery and the center, the imperial center, between how to do, how to approach local African Nigerian artistic tradition, um, indigenous art, and so forth. So all of the artists and cultural workers in the non-aligned are thinking about these things, and Yugoslav artists uh, and cultural workers are doing the same. And this is where I see the potential and interesting sort of uh, echoes um, in artistic production. So as I said, like those traditions elsewhere, people's art of Yugoslavia reflects the struggles of Balkan peasants and workers to claim political, social, and cultural agency and voice after the long period of revolutionary struggle in the first half of the 20th century. It is precisely because of this link between historical oppression and long period of political struggle that people's art both in Yugoslavia, but in other non-aligned countries is representative of attempts to grapple with cultural agency. Um, number six, there's an important element in the production of people's art in Yugoslavia and elsewhere, as it offered critiques of standardized, view, uh, standardized views of which forms of culture were deemed important and which were not. This is also important parallel to the non-aligned's own attempt to provide agency, legitimacy, and importance to cultural productions of countries who were often seen at the, uh, at the, uh, as peripheral. And um, uh, number seven, I'm also particularly interested and uh, I'm just gonna jump to this. I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, how politically engaged art and people's art open up a space for progressive myth-making or revolutionary utopian imagination, which is necessary for transformation of the social and political actuality. In other words, how this form of engaged art works together with political work. In this way, popular or people's art and its relatives uh, amateur, outsider, and similar art productions offer a glimpse of a more democratic and equitable understanding of what progressive and non-hierarchical culture might look like, recognizing the political emancipatory potential in progressive mythologies, as opposed to nationalistic, fascistic, and capitalist mythologies, which have both in the 20th century and more currently usurped popular and people's culture and its political potential, we must think about how these examples from the past can serve as models for the future. And finally, these forms of art making also challenge the bourgeois understanding of art as an autonomous realm of individual artistic freedom by emphasizing communal and social importance, political importance of art making. This was something that was contemplating by many cultural workers across the non-aligned world and more broadly. So very, very briefly, because I know I'm running out of time, um, I'm looking at, uh, in this kind of very broad research uh, that I've just outlined, I'm looking at the work of Branja Mraz, but I'm also looking at the more broadly, the, the work of um, non-traditionally trained artists uh, from other countries and how they echo each other and how their aesthetic, formal and conceptual political interests echo each other. So for example, um, um, uh, people like uh, Mario Ortaga, the Latin American artist, with um, um, even Genelic, of course, uh, Castel Basile, who was a Haitian, Haitian artist, uh, Noel Guzman Bofil, who was uh, Cuban. But also, I'm, I'm interested in how those who collaborated with, uh, with these uh, non traditionally uh, trained artists, like uh, people. Uh, painters like Ochecho, uh, Ochecho uh, Uche Okeke and uh, Kristo Hegedusic, how they have navigated and tried to understand uh, the peasant and workers' art uh, and how they've adopted in their own artistic practice forms of uh, peasant artwork. Um, and um, so I'm looking at the various exhibitions that were circulated of Yugoslav um, naive art uh, in the world and also the ways in which um, art of the naive artists were uh, shown in Yugoslavia. Um, and I'm also interested in where these things meet. So hybrid forms where uh, professional and not professional and uh, or academically trained and non-academically trained artists from Yugoslavia 
were shown in the world. So one big example is the people's liberation struggle in the work of Yugoslav visual artists from 1975, which was an exhibition that was circulated in Algeria, Senegal, Morocco, and Iraq. And here we see the two catalog, uh, catalogs from Algeria and uh, Senegal. Um, talking about Senghor, uh, the, um, the exhibition was shown in 1975 at the Théâtre National Daniel Serrano, which was um, built by Senghor in 1965. Um, and um, there was a number of different artists who were showcasing the liberation struggle, including Ivan Generalich, whose uh, work I mentioned, um, um, artists who were uh, participating in the, um, not, uh, in the struggle for uh, during World War II um, and those who were born after. And so this is, I'm looking at these moments where uh, these forms of art intersect, how they're political and then how were they uh, shown outside of Yugoslavia, especially in the non-aligned countries. Um, and this, this uh, traveling exhibition is a really interesting example. So I'm going to end, uh, end my presentation here. And, um, and if there's any questions, I can address them later on. Uh, thank you, Boena. Uh, you were almost right on time, so no worries. I'm sure there will be a lot of space for discussion. In part, we haven't been talking so much uh, until now about concrete artworks, but uh, this can definitely uh, play well into our discussions about uh, the place of Yugoslavia within the non-online movement. So I'm looking forward to the questions that the public, the physical and the virtual one might have. So, but uh, our last speaker today is Natasha Kovacevic. Uh, she is a professor of postcolonial literature at Eastern Michigan University and editor of Journal of Narrative Theory. Uh, she is the author of two monographs, uh, the first one, Narrating, na narrating Post-Communism, Colonial Discourse in Europe's Borderline Civilization, uh, published by Rutledge in 2008, and the second one, uh, Uncommon Alliances, Cultural Narratives of Migration in, the U in New Europe, uh, published by Edinburgh University Press in 2018. Um, she has also written articles on intersections between post-colonial and post-communist studies, Cold War Orientalism, avant-garde performance, art and literature, and film, and a uh, film about migration uh, to the European Union. Uh, she's, she has published widely in a number of important journals and in a number of edited collections. Her ongoing research concerns the cultural representations and post-colonial critiques of the European Union, and most recently, non-aligned literature and culture. Uh, she will be speaking to the, uh, today to us about Yugoslav non-alignment and the anti-colonial intellectual discourse. Uh, Natasha, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to see you. Uh, and I'm so sorry that I couldn't be with you in person today. Um, I know it's not easy to organize these conferences in hybrid format, so I really uh, appreciate um, all the work that you have done, uh, Paul and Yelena, to bring us all together and to uh, ensure that those of us who are over Zoom uh, feel like we're um, fully there um, at the conference so we can follow everything that's um, going on. Um, so my presentation will actually kind of um, echo both what um, Grega and uh, Boy and I have been talking about. So it's, it's actually really kind of a, a nice kind of synergy of um, uh, very similar topics. Um, so um, uh, I will be talking about the development of anti-colonial intellectual discourse um, in Yugoslavia. And so I will share my screen you know, a little bit later, but um, for the introduction. So in 1968, uh, Amos Cesaire's play, The Tragedy of King Christoph, was performed at the second uh, Bitev Theater Festival in Belgrade, two years after being performed at the first World Festival of Negro Arts in Dakar. Uh, that same year, Agustino Neto uh, presented his translated book of poetry at the October meetings of writers in Belgrade. In 1975, Leopold Sedar Sanghor um, participated in the Struga po Poetry Evenings and uh, was awarded its most prestigious award, the Golden Wreath. 
Um, during the era of decolonization, these and other writers, intellectuals, um, carried enormous prestige due to their status as both anti-colonial leaders and thinkers devoted to developing a new cultural expression and an anti-colonial critical discourse. In a 1977 special issue, Culture and Class Consciousness, published in the Yugoslav journal, Naše Teme, literary and cultural critic Nada Schwab Djokic, who wrote numerous texts about African literature and non-aligned countries' cultural development, writes, quote, Africa is a continent where artists and cultural workers are also revolutionary leaders, uh, citing the examples of Neto, Senghor, Toure, and Nureri. Uh, perhaps this suggests that the horizon of revolutionary change of our times can be gleaned precisely in culture and art because, she believes, these fields can escape colonial control more easily than, say, the economy. Schwab Djokic's definition of culture here also includes the field of uh, what she calls practical action, which does not need to be scientifically based nor accompanied by our modes of scientific analysis, which are in any case inadequate. So Yugoslav intellectuals writing on these topics were highly aware of the significance of developing an independent culture as well as an anti-colonial intellectual discourse for countries that sought full liberation for, from colonialism. As Yugoslavia developed its non-aligned foreign policy, its writers, intellectuals, and journalists, who were in many cases former revolutionaries and partisans, wrote about European colonialism and the various movements of liberation, themselves developing an anti-colonial intellectual discourse that in many tropes and rhetorical moves echoes the more familiar critical text by Emma Césaire, Franz Fanon, and C.L.R. James. Thus, for example, um, the travelogue, uh, Cerno na Belo, or uh, Black on White, um, 1962 text by influential avant-garde poet, novelist, and former partisan, Oscar de Vichon, whose travels in uh, West Africa overlap with Tito's own trip in 1961, and whose accounts were um, serially published um, in the Barba newspaper alongside reports on Tito's on Tito's trip uh, could be said to figure as a literary and critical accompaniment to an emergent political narrative. I will consider this text side by side with several contemporaneous Yugoslav travelogues and developing literary and cultural criticism to think about non-alignment also as an attempt to develop an anti-colonial intellectual discourse in Yugoslavia that is intertwined with the politics of national liberation. Um, such texts often quote and analyze anti-colonial poetry and prose, um, describe conversations with anti-colonial intellectuals slash revolutionaries, uh, address the necessity of developing an independent cultural policy, include subaltern narratives in an attempt to give voice to the colonized, and highlight the biases of colonial epistemology. So let me um, just share my screen. Hopefully I'll be able to navigate between these different things. Okay, hopefully you can see this. So I can't, unfortunately, I can't make it bigger just because I won't be able to uh, read my paper. But um, these are just some of the, the covers of the books that I will be reading if you're um, not, if, if you don't read Cyrillic. So Oscar de Vicho, Cerno na Bello um, is the, um, the, the book to your right. So de Vicho, for instance, repeatedly quotes African poetry that criticizes racism and colonialism and includes uh, a few lines from Notebook of a Return to the Native Land by the Martinican poet Emma Césaire because of his association with the Negritude movement. Uh, while in Guinea, he also meets and reports lyrics by the griot Jacate, uh, a highly esteemed bard and storyteller who himself took part in the battle against French rule and who spends the entire evening, he says, tirelessly reciting poems. His poems represent the oral anti-colonial history, spanning the uprisings of African peoples against uh, French colonial rule, depicting the exploitative conditions in which African and imported um, Asian laborers built the railroad in French West Africa, as well as their forced contribution to French war efforts during World War II. To draw attention to the damage wrought by colonial epistemology, De, De Vicho includes a first-person account of a retired Senegalese teacher, Mambu Papa, who had dedicated himself to the study of history, ethnography, and anthropology of his region. Mambu shared his research findings with visiting European scholars who proceeded to publish his work without crediting him, except for including a demeaning note, some black man told me. So Davicha here illustrates the ways in which African cultures have been misrepresented as Mambu says that European scholarship portrayed the rituals he studied as barbaric and his people as pre-logical, lazy, and immature. 
The vitro repeatedly highlights the destruction of various African cultures at the hands of colonial regimes uh, in his argument with a Swiss journalist who is an apologist for colonial benevolence. Um, contesting the colonial thesis that Africa has no history, the vitro points out that long before the French shut down the local schools, the University of Timbuktu was more famous than the universities of Oxford and Seville. Uh, he also details conversations with locals that anticipate the future debates on the language policy for independent African countries. For instance, the merits of continuing to use uh, European languages versus selecting one of the widely spoken African languages to serve as a regional uh, lingua franca. Documenting, like Davicho, anti-colonial struggles for liberation in real time, uh, Zdrako Petra, that we've al already mentioned at this conference, um, journalist, diplomat, and history scholar, published a number of books on Africa in general and Algeria and Egypt in particular, which combined reportage, political analysis, and travel narrative. In these texts, Petra develops um, a painstaking analysis of racist discourses and their role in the maintenance of colonial hierarchies, includes his interviews with African intellectuals, leaders, uh, intellectual leaders, um, or both. Uh, for instance, uh, Nkrumah, Lumumba, and Fanon, uh, just to mention a few figures, uh, and highlights um, the important link uh, between culture and politics um, dedicates many chapters to Black arts movements, um, Senghor and the poetry of negritude, and um, oral, oral literary traditions, to mention a few topics. Uh, as just one example, in his doctoral dissertation, which was published as Alger de Nezavisnosti, or Algeria until independence in 1967, Petra states that his goal is to write an anti-colonial history of Algeria and challenge its, quote, conscious falsification at the hands of not just French colonial rulers, but of European historiography in general, which considers Algeria as a land that has no history or tradition. To this end, uh, as he writes about the Algerian War of Independence, in addition to French and other European sources, Petr also draws on local Algerian uh, sources and subaltern narratives. Um, the FL FLN's proclamations published in El Mujahid newspaper, unpublished military reports about the war, prison diaries and testimonies, war memoirs, as well as the ethnographic research and interviews that Petra collected personally while he was a participant eyewitness and daily chronicler of the war. While he predictably uh, frames his analysis within Marxist and of course non-aligned terms, um, he also repeatedly criticizes Marxists, especially the French Communist Party, for remaining oblivious to the racial dynamics of the colonial problem as well as to the specificities of Algeria's national culture and social values. Um, so um, the, in terms of my um, uh, visual representations of, of these books, um, I, the, the cover of Petra's uh, book is actually not particularly exciting, but what is um, quite fascinating is the inside cover. Um, so this is what I photographed. Uh, this is one of the drawings and he includes um, in the book uh, by, and this is by Dragan Savic, who was, um, a comic strip artist, uh, caricaturist, illustrator um, who worked for various newspapers, but he was also commissioned by the FLN to create a series of, of drawings documenting the Algerian War of Independence. And he spent um, some time with the FLN um, in Algeria in 1961. So I thought it, that that would be kind of fun to share. Um, all right, um, so the, the, uh, the final travelogue that I will talk about today is um, by Nikola Vitorovic, uh, that's the, the cover to the left. Uh, his travel of Tsernesuze Konga, or the Black Tears of the Congo, um, uh, which came out in 1961, uh, is his eyewitness account of the final months of Lumumba's life and the unfolding Congo crisis. Um, and they, and they are, these are presented as a counterpoint to Western media narratives that present Lumumba as the root cause of the crisis rather than its victims. Uh, reporting his several interviews with Lumumba is intended to amplify Lumumba's voice and improve his image in the face of a media blockade and sparse and biased colonial biographies that Vitorovic references. Like the Vicha who, hearing um, Kwame Nkrumah uh, speak in Conakry, says that he's one of the most magnificent orators he has um, ever heard. Uh, Vitorovic is similarly taken with Lumumba as a confident, calm, and eloquent uh, chess player, how he describes him, who keeps making powerful moves despite his physical confinement. In addition to Lumumba, Vitorovic, like Petra and Davicho, also includes first-person accounts of various Congolese acquaintances from the social margins, such as, for example, uh, the elderly man Gabriel, a former servant to a Belgian engineer who routinely 
subjected his black staff to racist abuse. Um, the book, in fact, meticulously highlights blackness and whiteness as categories that organize segregation in all aspects of Congolese life, from physical space to employment sectors to everyday relationships to class differences. At one point, uh, Vitorovich criticizes the offensively named Museum of Native Life because it reinforces the stereotypes of mysterious Africa, musealizing both the trophies of jungle explorers and the ritual objects that the Congolese use in everyday life. His travel clearly intends to develop a contrasting strategy of representation that can challenge the racism of colonial epistemology and culture. As scholars who have written about this topic before me, like um, Nemanja Radunić, Jelena Subotić, Sergin Vucetić, and others, have also argued this strategy of representation does not always depart from Eurocentrism, not, nor from established racial stereotypes. In this presentation, however, I'm interested specifically in how they make a contribution to the concurrent development of global anti-colonial discourses. Although I agree that their bias and blind spots should in no way be glossed over, of course, um, the whole picture will be part of a much longer study that I plan to write. So the publication of these uh, popular travelogues coincides with increasing scholarship in Yugoslavia, especially from the early 1960s onward, that addresses the need for developing an independent culture in decolonizing countries and for articulating an effective anti-colonial intellectual discourse. So my examples come from several journals that publish on literature, cultural studies, and social issues in general. In addition to including individual articles and the aforementioned topics, there are frequent thematic issues dedicated most often to Africa. Uh, Nasha Tema, for instance, had two in 1961, 1979. Uh, in the late 70s alone, there were thematic issues on African um, literature and art and uh, culture and just various kinds of social uh, issues in um, um, journals like Polja, uh, Vidici, Politička Misa, Marxism u Svetu, Republika, and Argumenti. Uh, in the 80s, special issues in African literature and culture appear in Kultura and Knjižna Smotra. Naše teme also published a special issue in South America in 1966, as you can see in the middle um, uh, illustration. Uh, and on Chile in 1973, and finally, two issues dedicated to India in 1977 and 1984. In addition, we encounter many thematic issues and topics ranging from culture and decolonization, Yugoslav cultural cooperation with non-aligned countries, to culture and revolution. This development in literary and cultural criticism is mirrored in the publishing industry. Um, starting from the 1950s, literature from Africa and the African diaspora, the Middle East, and the Indian subcontinent is being increasingly translated and published with intensifying translations from the 1960s onward of Central and South American and East Asian uh, literature. Uh, at times, um, translations were published very soon after the original. For instance, Algerian author Katib Yassin's novel Nejma was translated in 1952, uh, I'm sorry, 1958, which is two years after the original. And Nigerian author Amos Tutuola's The Palm Wine Drinkard was published in 1954, um, two years after uh, the original. In addition, academic monographs that critically analyze European colonialism as well as document anti-colonial struggles begin appearing as early as the late 1940s. Uh, going back to journals, um, they publish original or translated studies that attempt to familiarize um, Yugoslav readers with distinguished anti-colonial leaders who are also writers and intellectuals. Um, such as Gandhi, Cabral, Lumumba, Senghor, um, Césaire, Pruma, and of course, Fanon, who I will focus on briefly as an example. So Fanon's Wretched of the Earth appears in Slovenian translation in 1963. As you can see, this is a middle um, image uh, on the slide. Uh, and in Croatian translation in 1973, to the right on the, sl on the slide, um, but before these translations are available, uh, Nasha Tema, for instance, publishes numerous articles from the 1960s onward, which analyze Fanon's thoughts on independent cultural development, the psychology of colonial oppression, on violence and revolution. In 1962, translating an article from Presence Africaine, uh, Franjus Denko discusses African intellectuals' debates on an independent cultural um, development, the varying ideals of Pan-Africanism, and Fanon's radical critique of European civilization and colonial mimicry, which results in his vision of creating a third Europe uh, at the end of Wretched of the Earth. This is followed in a um, 
in the 19, in, I'm sorry, in a 1962 issue by the original article written by Janine Matillon, which meticulously analyzes Fanon's anti-colonial philosophy as inspired by his background in psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic training and practice. His participation in the Algerian war, his discussion of women's emancipation in Algeria, and his intertextuality with other anti-colonial thinkers and with European philosophy. Uh, in a 1973 issue, Vyacheslav Mikitsin discusses Fanon's theory of revolution, offering an overview of black skin, white masks, and wretched of the earth, as well as a bibliography of influential criticism of Fanon. Mikitsin compares Singhor and Fanon, noting that Singhor considered Fanon too radical, whereas Fanon criticized Singhor's vision of socialism, uh, criticized Singhor's vision of socialism for its mysticism. Fanon cautions against mysticism and the idealization of tradition in the development of post-colonial culture. Mikitsin sees Fanon as opposed to the kind of nationalism that relies on the cult of personality and advocating instead an absolute decentralization of power. Therefore, he concludes, Fanon believes that a national culture must be dedicated to fostering democratic development along with socialist development. My final example is an article by Nada Shwabjokic that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, which discusses the conflict between traditionalist and modern conception of, conceptions of culture in post-colonial Africa, bringing into conversation a number of African writers and thinkers, including Fanon. She focuses primarily on the cultural genocide committed by colonialism and on Fanon's analysis of the colonized person's alienated consciousness, which leads to colonial mimicry and negation of one's subjectivity. Simultaneously, Yugoslav scholars debate various issues related to post-colonial cultural development, including the legacy of colonial education and language use, the fraught relationship between tradition and modernity, the issues of multilingualism and multiculturalism, the problems of cultural self-representation, the difficulties of financing an independent publishing industry, the problems of post-colonial literature as being exoticized and ghettoized on the world literary market, uh, and the dangers of reducing socially engaged literatures to mere didacticism, to mention just a few topics. You can probably recognize that a lot of these topics are still being debated in um, academic um, circles uh, today. So we can see the diversity and complexity of perspectives the scholarship explores using the example of the literary and cultural movement negritude which is touched upon repeatedly by most scholars writing on the African diaspora. Thus, for instance, Nada Schwab Djokic considers negritude from a critical perspective, arguing that a diasporic community should not be articulated through racial essentialism, but instead through the complex social and historically situated inequalities between Europe and Africa. Radomir Subotic complicates the charges of racial essentialism by, argue, by arguing that blackness does not refer to skin color, but to a social condition, but nonetheless uh, sees Senghor as insufficiently radical in his development of an independent post-colonial culture. Bisirka Tsvetipchenin sees negritude as suspended in the gap between the invocation of tradition and the anticipation of modern development and concludes that post-colonial national cultures need not see these as either or propositions, but rather negotiate a realistic third option, which in her view also takes into account the power of mass media such as film. Petr Guberina, in turn, defends negritude from the frequent accusation that it is insufficiently political, arguing that this engaged cultural movement has also been a call to arms. Um, he emphasizes Singhor's history of fighting in World War II and being a Nazi concentration camp prisoner, as well as Césaire's highly public break with the French Communist Party and his influence on Fanon. So finally, um, just moving towards um, wrapping up, uh, given time constraints, I will only briefly touch on the fascinating debates among Yugoslav scholars uh, and cultural workers about the successes or rather relative failures of the non-aligned cultural policy in the field of literary publishing and studies. At a roundtable devoted to non-aligned literatures and translation, part of the 21st UNESCO conference in Belgrade in 1980, participants observed that school and university curricula across the board continue to be Eurocentric. Uh, and include very few Asian, African, and Central or South American texts. From 1968 to 1978 in Serbia, for instance, only 3.4% of all translated books were from non-aligned and other non-European countries. Over the years, there were constant calls to launch inter interdisciplinary African studies programs at the university level, at the university level, which didn't materialize. So we might conclude that the anti-colonial sensibilities and discourses that we see in intellectual circles did not affect cultural policy, uh, perhaps to the extent that they could have. Nonetheless, um, it is important to reconstruct these early networks of intellectual solidarity since 
according to Monica Papascu, who uh, writing in, at Penn Point, um, uh, contemporary scholarship tends to privilege Western academic postcolonial theory starting in the late 70s. And more recently, I would add the contemporary articulations of decolonial theory. On the other hand, early anti-colonial intellectual work is often downplayed as merely pioneering um, and additionally as compromised through its embroilment uh, either in the violence of national liberation or in uh, radical Marxism or in postcolonial authoritarianism. So on that note, I will end and stop sharing my screen. So um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to address them in the Q&A. Um, thank you, Natasha. I hope you see the public uh, that's joining us here physically. You got a really big applause. Oh, okay, uh, great, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm 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 really happy that you ended with what you ended. I think it's a really good note to our conversation about uh, what's happening re recently in theory on de decolonization, but also what we have been discussing in the last few days. So I would like to open up the floor for discussions to uh, any of our th questions for to any of our three speakers. As Paul, I would like to give advantage to Zoom if we have Zoom questions, but if no, no? okay, then Paul. Paul and Anna, I see. Will somebody help me with uh, the microphone? <laughs> and I hope we've got a lot of time. <laughs> that was amazing, and I could listen to this for a, for for so much longer. And I'm yeah, I'm going to really try and be brief. And I promise there will be at least two questions. Firstly, Natasha, we are in contact with Nada Svobjokic and with Biza Kasvech, and in, we had hoped one or both of them would be able to come here. But very much they are part of this project, and thank you for that, that work of bringing what they were doing back in. Gregor, um, I would love to talk to you over several beers about the complex work of translation of concepts of Creole, hybridity, and uh, mimicry, but I'm not gonna do that. I, the question for you, Gregor, is this liveliness and rhythm thing, did Kerlesia acknowledge that it was Senghor? Did Kerlesia know it was Senghor? Or is this an example of two people entirely independently coming up with this similar concepts? For Natasha, but I would be very happy if Gregor and or Boyana would, would chip in on this. Given what you said, and perhaps your answer is towards the end, given what you said, how come the Praxis Group and the Kortschule Schola were completely absent, uh, did not join in any of these debates, did not reference any of these debates, and did not, to my knowledge, ever refer to Fanon. Oh, I guess I was put on the screen. Um, no, uh, to my knowledge, Carleza didn't uh, cite anyone, but I also wouldn't think that he um, drew on them. I think with Alexi as well, um, they come up, you know, and I'm pretty sure that they've never talked, even though um, they were both in Paris at different points. Um, they, this like idea of, uh, or like this theory of history that they both came up with as this kind of um, discontinuous, but continuous in a different way, like accumulation of things, um, right? Like dialectical, but but basically, you know, Carleja at one point in this particular speech says that, uh, I don't know if I ended up citing that, that the reality of Yugoslavia right now is, or like at every particular moment of the now is permeated by six cycles, um, by the cycles of six centuries synchronously, right? And um, it was this, this uh, kind of theory of amalgamation, right, that uh, Alexi also presented at uh, the Congress a couple of years later. Um, you know, and I think this kind of uh, 
also ecological perspective to it. I think it's not by um, coincidence that Kurleza was also using all of these organicist metaphors. Um, and, and as with Senghor, I mean, I think also Senghor isn't, um, you know, the first person to say that. I think the kind of reception um, and this uh, entrenchment of like very rationalist, secularist um, forms of enlightenment thought that we've had um, have just sort of overshadowed those kinds of ways of thinking and knowing that we all know about, right? Like the feelings that we have in the gut, um, the importance of rhythm, right? In both in terms of like the temporality, but um, also the kinds of bodily rhythms and things like that. So um, I think it's a super fascinating um, kind of uh, thinking of similar things in the simultaneously, right? In this particular historical conjuncture that was happening across the board. All right, um, thank you for that question, uh, Paul. Um, that, that, that's a really good question. Um, I, so one, one thing, of course, they, they were the, the reason that a lot of these scholars could um, talk about Fanon is that they read him in the original. So I think it, it probably has to do with also like who was able to read uh, Fanon in the original French because before uh, he was translated um, while in the early 60s in Slovenia and then in the early 70s uh, in Croatian and before this started circulating. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually not really familiar, I'm not well familiar with the scholarship on praxis. So I, I you know, couldn't say like whether they were quoting Fanon or not. Um, but this is a good question. Um, I mean, I my um, research on this has just begun. So I've only, um, you know, looked over um, a, a certain number of um, literary and cultural journals. Uh, but nonetheless, I've been uh, kind of pleasantly surprised to see that there um, are, um, there is quite a, a a few articles that uh, address not only Fanon, I mean, Fanon was just my kind of convenient example because just like so many people write about Fanon, uh, but you know, they, they talk about so many other um, scholars as well. Uh, but I was, you know, there, there seems to be very much an awareness of um, the kinds of post-colonial topics and uh, issues and problems that, uh, you know, I just never really would have dreamed that all these people would have been um, addressing that early on. Um, so why they wouldn't have um, addressed Fanon, I, I really don't know. I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately. I'm gonna just uh, add a little comment to this. Um, I. One of the things that I find is problem with the ways in which, let's say, things like Praxis Group are um, analyzed is that, uh, and this kind of has a, um, has a parallel sometimes in the art world, that only certain kinds of artists or only certain kinds of intellectuals are presented in the West and then they're overrepresented and other forms of knowledge are not. So Praxis Group had, um, a standing before the war of the 90s, um, sort of in, in certain um, intellectual uh, international circles. Um, but that's, that doesn't mean that within Yugoslavia, there was a lot of intellectual uh, work production that is virtually unknown to the West, uh, but quite powerful and important. Similar thing or parallel to this is artists. You know, in, since the 90s, there was a lot of emphasis on so-called 1960s conceptual neo-avant-garde neo performance art forms that now everybody knows about and everybody talks about. Um, but these other people who were also making art were completely uh, ignored and are unknown. Uh, but their work is very, very important and is important not just because they've uh, done something that is outside of the kind of modernist or postmodernist ethos, but also because they've um, initiated certain questions that could be seen as critical of 
the kinds of practices that existed at the time or that are internationally recognized. So I think that there's that. Um, and um, there is a kind of predominance and especially in terms of language, like what has been translated into English and how has it permeated English academia. Um, I think that also the circulation of academic knowledge produces these kinds of blind spots um, or, you know, in the West as well. Um, one of the things that sort of uh, occurred to me while I was listening to Natasha and Grega is the um, and I keep coming back to this every time we talk about the NAM, is that Yugosla Yugoslavia really only existed as such for 45 years. That's a very small period of time to develop an enormous amount of tasks. You know, we listened this morning about NANAP, which in itself was, uh, you know, a century long project, if you will, if you really want to do it. So there was all of these amazing uh, attempts to sort of build something and they were stopped. And I want to emphasize the importance of socialism within this, right? It, it, it did not continue after 1990. It, either it was, as, uh, as uh, it was mentioned this morning, it's being abused for very, very dark political uh, reasons nowadays uh, to kind of for nationalist purposes or it was simply ignored because it was seen as funny. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about naive art that has become really problematic after the 1990s. What kind of naive art has been promoted in the world as well? So there's all of these kind of um, narratives that are stopped uh, uh, when the wars of, uh, and the breakup of Yugoslavia starts. Um, and now we've got 25, 30 years of complete sort of um, discombobulation of this narrative, and now we're trying to piece it together. So as much as they were building for 45 years, we had 30 years of its com complete negation. Um, so I'm just sort of putting it in a more kind of larger context of, of how this knowledge is produced relates back to, you know, praxis and other things. Can I just piggyback on that real quick? Um, yeah, I'm glad that you said that, um, Boyna, because I was thinking about that also when they're um, criticizing themselves for not translating more literature, you know, from the non-line countries. And this is happening, this conversation is happening in 1980, right? And so they have research for like the last 10, 15 years. Um, and so the, this whole kind of non-aligned, uh, you know, politics is only like a couple of decades old. Um, so if they had continued, I mean, who's to say that, you know, they wouldn't have uh, uh, translated more, but there's so many other issues. I mean, there, you know, there, there's also the scarcity of, um, of the independent, there's the scarcity of independent publishing in a lot of the post-colonial states, especially in Africa, right? There's the impossibility of getting some of these texts and translating them also via European languages and European publishing houses and this whole kind of like neo-colonial dynamic that they have with British and French publishers and so on. So, so, so I, I'm very, there's very much this sense that, um, yeah, they, they just simply haven't had enough time to develop some of these cultural policies in, you know, in a meaningful way. Oh, and just one, uh, absolutely, Natasha, I totally agree with you on that. And with Grega, uh, I think yeah. like there's a, there's I'm a, sorry. sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can finish, but I just want to like let you know uh, if we can like make room for some more questions here. We have like three waiting, so and we're already running late. So just so you know, but please finish the thought, and so we can do many uh, some more questions. I just wanted to say that what Grego was really, what his presentation really pointed out is that there are these parallel emerging ways of thinking that are not necessarily um uh, uh, known to each other they become afterwards but i think they emerge uh, i think Krilaja is a great example with with Sanghor. i think this is you know and and they emerge from material conditions they emerge they emerge from particular similar parallel material and historical conditions uh which is i think we have to come back to the material context of historical reasons why these people start thinking about these things at the same or similar timeline. Um, thank you for the um, very inspiring um, and obviously um, thought inspiring primarily um, presentations on the arts and um, artists. 
Uh, I have, have questions for Grega and for um, Boyana. I just want to comment on what Paul said very briefly. Um, I think that the question about why Praxis did not engage with um, Franz Fanon and with the um, huge number of artists um, and writers in Africa, well, the same question could be asked, like, did the Frankfurt School um, <laughs> engage at the time? Part of it could be. Precisely. Part of it is, okay, translations. The other thing, to what extent empirical studies and empirical um, optics of the world was in fact the, the grounds of, of research for these uh, people or to what extent they were really interested more in, in the, the re-theorizing of, of the leftist view of the world rather than doing uh, field work. And that doesn't go only... Uh, when speaking about their interest in the artists and writers of the non-Western world, it would go for many other issues in, in the empirical uh, sphere. Um, uh, Greg, well, the first thing that I was thinking, obviously, when looking at this picture, is that there are really so many men and not a single woman. Uh, and to what extent was it reflected upon at the time of the meeting of the writers in Paris in 1956? Was this something that anyone commented on? Uh, was there any kind of um, talk about gender, gender uh, equality in the light of their um, liberation, anti-colonial uh, struggle in the role of, of literature? And uh, so this is more like a wondering. And uh, the second question, was there an emphasis on a particular form of literature that these writers were considering as a particular form of weapon and the title of, of uh, the, the piece that you quoted from, from Alexis was, if I'm not uh, mistaken, was Où va le roman? Uh, where does the novel go? So what, was this something specifically about the novel um, itself? Was there an emphasis on certain forms of the arts? Um, also, what, what I was thinking about when listening to what these writers were talking about, the importance and, and their own engagement in the political uh, struggle, Alexis being killed uh, in the attempt to overthrow Duvalier, um, were there also uh, uh, in correspondence with people who were political uh, theorists, people who were engaged in the forms of dependency uh, theory at the time, because there is some correspondence. I'm just wondering. And uh, Boyana, I'm wondering to what extent there um, there is a correspondence, and to what extent it is important to get rid of the concept of naive art. Um, the the examples that you were showing uh, mainly refer to. The, the, the images of the engagement with the Second World War, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but there were other uh, periods during which these artists were also perhaps engaged in something much more commercial. And uh, maybe you're also talking in your work about Zuzana Halupova, um, who was one of the most commercially important um, painters and who was called uh, the naive artist and who didn't have a problem as far as I know with the fact of being called the naive artist so this type of naming renaming I'm just wondering to what extent uh, it is important for you to get rid of this uh, the name and, and replace it for what reason okay okay yeah thank you for those questions um, I'll just say quickly on the, the gender question. Uh, in Paris in particular, it was actually only uh, Richard Wright uh, visiting from the US who actually um, made that particular remark that nobody really followed up on. But there's been scholarship afterwards about how actually a lot of women were central to the organizing of the conference. And in that um, group portrait that I've shown, there was actually, I think it might have been Diop's wife who was sitting next to him, surrounded by tons of men. Um, uh, 
um, and uh, the Nadal sisters and, uh, you know, um, uh, Suzanne Césaire was also an important person in the Nicritude movement, things like that. As for uh, the question of form, actually for Alexis in particular, yeah, because uh, I've quoted from two of his essays, the one where he talks about the novel in particular, it's also like a great moment in it where he says, the novel actually is um, a form that allows us to transcend the antinomy between art and science. Um, right, because he says uh, science produces only an abstract, um, uh, you know, uh, conception of the human and the kind of like really rationalist uh, analyses of the world as it exists, uh, whereas art is a kind of uh, cognitive practice that gives us um, a thicker and richer description of the entire reality. And he said that um, he was actually also a doctor, I've mentioned, like uh, a neurologist and a novelist at the same time. And he said, my work um, as both sort of falls into the same domain of knowledge of the human. Um, and in his essay that he presented at the conference, he was actually talking about the marvelous realism um, which is not quite the same as magical realism, which, um, you know, whose exoticism got packaged and um, uh, promoted on the international liber uh, literary market. Um, and he's sort of saying it's, it's both a particular and a general in a way. He says, you know, the marvel is, um, he has this beautiful quote that I won't remember now. The marvel is the garment in which uh, people clothe their wisdom. Um, and so he was saying the, he was talking about a particular Haitian marvelous realism, but um, he said that it's actually part of the global trend of social realism and perhaps even socialist, um, uh, the kind of uh, underlying ideas of socialist realism, if we actually think of them and translate them into um, particular context. And I'll just end by saying that uh, the point you've also made about, um, and, and with regards to praxis, right? I think uh, the fact that they all thought of art uh, as a kind of transformative material practice and of themselves as you know, fighters, writers, as um, I've said, had, um, yeah, everything to do with how they also theorized the world around them. Um, and the fact that they were so committed to realism um, and they understood, I mean, you know, a lot of people understood realism, I think more as a politics than as a kind of predetermined aesthetic that would be the same everywhere, but they insisted on claiming um, realism as having that kind of um, real life effects in life as opposed to modernism. And especially, I think they had a problem with abstraction. Um, I'm gonna try to answer the question. It's a very broad uh, topic and it is a very complex one. Um, I'm gonna concentrate on Yugoslavia uh, very briefly. The reason why I am problematizing the, the, the term naive is because uh, of um, post-World War II various discussions, uh, theoretical and amongst artists themselves around the term itself. So for example, the artist who I mentioned, Franjo Mraz, was accused of stop being naive. And he was advised to go into the art school. Um, and in his, uh, in his autobiography, very brief autobiography, he says, you know, they never told, they never said to Ivan Generalic that he should go back to art school. Uh, but they told me, and they have no problem with even Gedrelich uh, practicing his art, but somehow they have a problem with me. So there is a, there, there, there's a political and theoretical formal element um, uh, very, very, very interestingly around this. Um, and a lot of the artists themselves were uh, beginning in the 1970s and 80s to critique the term uh, from their perspective, because it was used in some ways in a paternal, paternalistic way by theorists uh, and by curators who curated the art. Um, and this is sort of, if you read the, the writings uh, about the 
artists, um, it becomes very, very clear. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is, uh, of course, the commercialism. Um, and absolutely, I'm not you know, accusing uh, that it's bad that people should make money off the work that they do. Uh, it doesn't diminish anything, but it is, it has produced certain kinds of artistic practices that became problematic uh, in, again, in the 70s and 80s and, and now. So all of this to say that um, I'm trying to negotiate, in other words, how to, uh, how to uh, understand this type of art without being, without falling into a kind of hierarchy of art. Because at the end of the day, all of these forms of art in Yugoslavia and outside uh, were deemed to be outsider on the periphery of the mainstream art. So I want to question this relationship, this kind of, uh, you know, um, professional, non-professional, naive, uh, you know, academically trained. So I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to, to think about it. Again, I'm at the beginning. So I'm just sort of, uh, these are my initial kind of thoughts. Um, and of course, in Yugoslavia, naive art didn't start in 1945. I'm, I chose to talk a little bit more about uh, politically engaged art during war because that's where uh, the professionally or academically trained artists and naive art, so-called naive artists intersected because a lot of them were fighting in the war together and made work together. So we see the kind of hybridity of it and porousness. But of course it started in the, in the early 20th century, well before the World War II with the work of Zemnia. So um, again, I'm still thinking about it. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be revolutionary or anything. I'm just trying to rethink and re-imagine uh, the term with the view to critique this idea of autonomous art separated from mater its material realities and its pol political realities. So. Uh, I, uh, yeah, okay, we can, I suppose, uh, okay. So I am guessing since we, we're the last panel, I just want to say that we have here a comment from Rada Iveković and also Zoltan. So we can have, if it's okay with the organizers and Drugom, well, both of the, uh, we can have two more questions, then read the comments and finish the day. Will be just very brief. <coughs> uh, I want to thank Natasha for a really wonderful presentation, which taught me a lot. And uh, both me also, also points to the fact that it would be very, very important to re-examine actually the way the visual arts were involved in uh, non-aligned cultural politics because this is the, the sphere of cultural activity which is completely missing that theoretical part which is engaged uh, with the idea of decolonization. And I have a question for um, <coughs> Bojana. Um, I wanted also to ask why it is important to destabilize the, the or, or change the uh, term naive art that she explained. And, um, this is like a more of a comment than uh, of, the, of the question. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Boyana, you mentioned uh, that you mentioned that one of the of the of the motivations, your motivations for this kind of research this project which you are starting, is that um, um, positioning of naive art on the margins of the art world. Art world, if I understood you correctly. Did I? Uh, that related to the international art world, not to Yugoslav art world. Okay, but uh, also from the perspective of the international art world, naive art was incorporated in the complex of 20th century art quite early. And in Yugoslavia, the first exhibition, my major retrospective of naive art, which was that crucial moment for such kind of incorporation happened already in 1931. And uh, naive art was exhibited at Biennale in uh, Sao Paulo at Venice. So, so it was actually integral to, to modern art. And what was happening with, with naive art in the 70s and 80s is I think completely different kinds of set of problems which is from my perspective, much more connected to art markets. 
then to, to some really substantial theoretical discussions on the nature of, of naive art and its difference or specificities in correlation to modern art, to, to, to which it is always correlated from the beginning of the 20th century on. Let me just comment on that. I, I, I wouldn't agree that it was always and uh, easily inter integrated into modernist ethos um, and into the histories of art. And it's not just in Yugoslavia, but elsewhere. I, I agree with you. And this is why this is so interesting that, it, that uh, um, uh, naive art was important for Yugoslavia before World War II, which is exactly why I'm thinking about it and that it was integrated into the international exhibition circles um, uh, that you, uh, of, Yugoslav, uh, of Yugoslav cultural work and diplomatic work, uh, cultural diplomatic work. So uh, this is precisely why I'm thinking about it. Um, and I also agree that the issues around uh, the art market were sort of at the top of the, uh, at the top of the problematizing of naive art, but, there was also within naive art, there is also uh, um, a kind of a theoretical questioning. And I think the example of Franjo Mraz is very important, which is why I am thinking about him. And which is because he remained very, very politically engaged after World War II. And this was seen as somewhat uh, somewhat anachronistic and um, at the end of the day he did not get a, a, as much exposure as let's say as Ivan Gedralic who was uh, one of the main artists the uh, art artistic exports into uh, uh, Yugoslav, uh, into Yugoslav internationalism so um, I'm I'm thinking about it in, in naive art, both internally and externally, meaning internally to the discussions uh, within naive art, um, who were the experts, curators who were curating it, um, how, for example, the Museum of uh, Naive Art in Zagreb was presenting naive art. Um, so the, 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 the troubling of the term relates to the institutionalization of it as much as it relates to the kind of political engagement and political potential that I'm talking about. So it's a, it's, it's a, as I said, it's a complex issue and I've only had 15 minutes to present on it. Uh, but um, I think that there's more to thinking about uh, naive art than just its um, sort of um, uh, commercial aspect. Um, and I think that some of the debates that that uh, artists themselves initiated in the 70s and 80s are very important. Uh, and the way that they themselves critiqued uh, the institutionalization of naive art is also important, so. No, I just wanted to, uh, the, the remark on, on Mraz and, and the Generalic, uh, um, Mraz's uh, view of Generalic, perhaps it's just a question also of, uh, you know, a difference in, in um, how Generalic's art was accepted uh, by public, by, by art critic, of its, to use a, a not very popular term lately, quality of art. And one thing uh, concerning Maraz, as far as I know, he was in included in almost each exhibition, traveling exhibition of Yugoslav art, graphic art, uh, that, were, that were made by or, or, or produced by uh, um, Commission for Cultural Relations. So it seems that, I mean, I mean I'm not questioning uh, motiv your motivation to, for research starting from this anecdote, but I think that perhaps it would be important to, uh, to look or to approach naive art in Yugoslavia from the point of view of what was happening in the 70s from the point of view of the term world art, from the role of Merlot in the history of naive art after the Second World War and so on. This is just a comment and suggestion. Thank you. Question from Daniela today. Thank you. I'm gonna try to be brief and just to reiterate, sorry. Okay. 
Uh, just to kind of reiterate the two thoughts that emerged uh, this morning and this afternoon, one is uh, co-production co of the futures by Sarah Salem, and the second one is uh, Grega's non-alignment as method. Now that we are witnessing a renewed interest into post-colonial, decolonial theory uh, coming, okay, from some local scholars, I'm only talking about the former uh, Yugoslav region, uh, I think it's a generational thing. I think it's uh, it's something that's just happening uh, mostly with diasporic and migrant uh, scholars from the region. My question to, to all of you would be who are today's wretched of the earth and what do we do today when we're trying to claim uh, you know, uh, post-colonial post -colonial readings or decoloniality as an option coming from the Balkans. In other words, it was all easy, I would say, you know, after 1945, uh, we were on the wings of, I mean, when I say we, I think Yugoslavia, on the wings of the revolution, there was victory, there was liberation, there was the People's Liberation Army, then NAM, then AFG, we mentioned all these things. Uh, but what's with the present? And Sarah Salem today uh, talked about the difficulty of, of any uh, potential analysis that's coming from the present and kind of goes together with what you, Paul, said about the lack of empirical stuff about the present day everything, meaning, you know, studying post-socialism, uh, uh, privatization, social protests, uh, I don't know, corruption, whatever, in these post-socialist states. And how, when we make these claims, you know, when we say, well, you know, we've been colonized and peripheralized, not only by the Austro-Hungarians or the Turks or whoever, we've been peripheralized by these new post-socialist elites. So, my question would be, in term, you know, whether perhaps using non-alignment as a method is a way to, um, you know, avoid this conundrum, to kind of go beyond the historical research only, because that leaves all of us social scientists, for instance, with nothing but, you know, historical archival research. Why cannot or can we? I mean, and I'm asking you, uh, Boyana and, and uh, Natasha, uh, because, you know, I mean, I, Obviously, I know you, I know of your work, and I know you've been diasporic scholars uh, for a very long time, thinking Yugoslavia, thinking with Yugoslavia, and yeah, I would just like to hear uh, what all three of you or some of you have to say about, you know, kind of hijacking anti-colonial struggle, whether we called it post D, whatever, to analyze or to, to kind of be with the present moment, which is very unstable, very difficult, resisting uh, classification. Thank you. Okay, I will go first. Um, so I, I, I'm just seeing uh, Radevek, which is comment in the chat, and, and that's pretty much also my response. I think that I would think of the wretched of the earth today as um, refugees and, and migrants. Um, and of course, I mean, this is a huge problem um, that is facing the world is, um, I think maybe at, at this point, I don't even know if it's um, probably close to 70 million people uh, displaced around the world. But I would say that this is kind of the most pressing issue um, uh, that we're facing today, um, not just the, you know, the refugees and the migrants from the, um, the various kind of imperial or failed imperial interventions. Uh, of the last 20 years, but of course the climate migrants, uh, and this is going to become our reality um, in the um, you know, uh, coming decades. So I'm, I'm, I have to admit that I am uh, being, um, I'm pretty pessimistic about politics right now. So uh, while I think that the, the intellectual work that we are doing right now, uh, that, that we, we are doing, or that I have done personally, I think that um, in some ways, you know, it does important work. It, it does kind of uh, address, you know, some of these important um, um, kind of um, neurologic points, uh, both kind of locally and globally. Um, I think it has an effect. Um, for instance, my first book was dedicated to a Yugoslavia to come. Uh, and, and I, you know, I wrote this in my, as my dissertation in the 2000s, where, you know, saying the word Yugoslavia was, was still kind of controversial in the post-Yugoslav space. But now, you know, years later after that, I, I see so many um, uh, points of convergence, right, in terms of cultural um, and political and artistic collaborations in the Yugoslav space. So that, you know, makes me feel good about that. Um, 
Uh, I've also written about, my second book was about refugees and migrants uh, in the European Union. And um, I, I think that the problems of, um, the, the problems they're going to have to be resolved, not in these post-colonial spaces, but actually um, on uh, in Europe itself, right? I, I think that this is what the, the migration crisis will lead to in Europe, it's kind of a radical questioning of the signifier of Europe as something that we're supposed to idealize. Uh, and think of as, as benevolent, um, especially in the guise of the European Union. Um, so, so I don't know. I mean, this is kind of what I can hope for. Um, I, you know, my intellectual work so far has been, has tended to be pretty clairvoyant. So if, you know, if, if the, um, if this continues that hopefully, um, you know, um, the, also this emphasis on the not, on non-alignment that uh, we are all engaging in right now will hopefully lead to some kind of, uh, you know, um, actual um, effects on politics uh, and culture. Um, so, sorry, I will stop uh, rambling. I'm sorry, like I'm, I'm, I'm in Belgrade right now. So I'm having a hard time switching to English uh, because most of my daily life is carried in, uh, on in Serbian. So I will uh, mute myself and just, um, share the floor with my um, I, I would just uh, add to this that um, you know we can say yes uh, it was easy to think about non-alignment in 1945 although it wasn't it was extremely difficult because the country was destroyed and in uh, and in danger in fact uh, but non-alignment, as I'm trying to continually point to, has a longer traje historical trajectory. Uh, non-alignment did not start in 1955 or 54. It started a long before that in the early 20th century. And it started within the ranks of Communist Party, Socialist Party, and those people who were sent by the Austro-Hungarian Empire to fight against the, Sla the other Slavs. Uh, in fact, somewhere around 30,000 Yugoslavs uh, or what, what will become Yugoslavia fought in the October Revolution. And those people came back and brought some of the ideas of October Revolution to Yugoslavia. So this is all, um, and Yugoslavia, of course, before World War II, especially communists, where we, we see these ideas that we talk about were illegal. Half of them were in in uh, in jail, so it was very difficult, in fact, to think about progressive Yugoslavia at the time because of the fascist monarchist regime that was uh, impeding upon, as well as other imperialist powers that were impeding on Yugoslavia. So I would say that, you know, uh, this did not come easy. Uh, it came with a lot of uh, uh, fighting um, before and during World War II and World War One. Um, and I, as a refugee myself, former refugee, can speak to this and say that one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why I'm doing this work is because, um, is because I have lost my language, my culture, my, my state, um, and I am reflecting upon this historical uh, trajectory of Yugoslavia in order to learn from it uh, and use the po political potential uh, for the future. And one of the lessons that I've learned 25 years, 26 years living in Canada is that I have more in common with other immigrants, non-Western immigrants who come here than I do with those who live here who are considered themselves white Canadians. And I think, you know, Natasha can probably vouch for this as well. Um, this is something that one learns very quickly, and I think it's an important political lesson and why I'm doing this work. Um, and so it, it comes with a lot of, um, it doesn't come with like hijacking, but it comes with a realization and learning from others, learning for, from my friends and colleagues from Ethiopia, from India, who I've met here, who I work with. Um, and so it comes, my own self-realization and realization of history of Yugoslavia comes by reflecting and thinking with others who come from other parts of the world. 
Okay, so we prolong for half an hour. I see people here are already tired, but before we go, I just want to read two longer comments. Well, not so long, but a bit longer that we have. Uh, first one from Rada Iveković, uh, which relates to the praxis debate. So she says, I worked at the philosophy department of Zagreb University until 1991-92 with the praxis philosophers group who were for the founders older than I. You must know that they had willingly employed a, uh, as professor at the department first Cedomil Veljačić in the drive to introduce knowledge about extra European continents. The department of Indian studies at Zagreb University was created at the same time. Veljačić was my Indian philosophy teacher, a specialist for Asian philosophies, and after he had become a Buddhist monk in Ceylon, they employed me, wanting uh, the chair to continue. Uh, I was in, uh, sorry, sorry. Mm, I was in the chair for Asian philosophies during all these year, all those years. Both the older generation of Praxis as well as colleagues of my generation in Praxis were unconsciously Eurocentric through Marxism, though not purposely. The younger generation were maybe even more, more Eurocentric and anti-feminist than the older Praxis guys. Uh, who? Uh, I'm sorry. Who? Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, and then the older Praxis guys, who after all had employed, employed first Veljačić and then me to cover those cultures. So this is the first one, and then we have one from Zoltan. Uh, <laughs> clapping, huh? <laughs> uh, Zoltan, Hungarian leftists today reach back to translations of a few negritude, uh, pan-Africanist and non-aligned authors, but only to abstractly strengthen their philosophical and political position for example, in uh, anti-imperialist critique, but are not engaging with historical studies about these authors, and there are very little comparative insights. They ignore all new research, so they remain largely Eurocentric. On the other hand, some right-wing and government-supporting intellectuals are cu curiously hijacking these arguments and authors to argue for a nationalist and nativist conservative culture war against the globalist, liberal, leftist, Western imperialists. So this is from Zoltan, let's see. Uh, Zoltan also left uh, a link for something he's doing to anybody connected to or interested in Natasha's uh, paper. So I'm hoping we can get the, the, the links later to Paul and Yelena. Um, and then we have one comment, uh, again, uh, ne I think Nela Milic. Uh, it is important to acknowledge East European scholars who fall into that category, refugees and migrants, and last Zoltan. But do remember that migrants are various, so sticking just to this category may, may conflate many positions and may reinforce current essentialization of migrants by the far right. So, uh, I, I suppose I'm really sad that you're not here with us in Rijeka. I guess we would have a really interesting uh, dinner or drink before. I'm uh, happy to have chaired this session and thank you all for participating in the discussion and lectures. Thank you. Uh, please join us tomorrow at 10.30 uh, Central European time for a conversation uh, with Tvrtko Jakovina and Paul Stubbs. And I guess we're having dinner at 8, right? Okay, for those of us, you in Rijeka, our dinner is at 8. Uh, we have it on the paper. Okay, th thank you guys. Uh, Natasha, Boana, Grega. Thank you.